Okay, thank you for bearing with us um, as we tried to you know, sort all of the technical aspects of this meeting. Um, for those of you who have the program, uh, we will first have our panel on health humanities and the health professions from now until 5.45. Um, then there will be a break for dinner from 5.45 until 6.30. And then we'll have a panel on environment and risk from 6.30 to 7.15, but maybe to 7.30, uh, just to give a little bit more question and answer period. Um, and then we'll have a final culminating conversation with the speakers. We are so delighted to welcome you all back. Um, it was a very rich conversation uh, yesterday, and um, I think this will uh, continue in that vein. Um, so I'm just, I, I don't wanna get in the way, but I did wanna make a couple of opening remarks. Um, just to uh, thank um, all of you for being here, uh, to thank uh, Abhishek um, Sand, to uh, Tanya Munya and Charlotte Whitman um, for all of the administrative help and making sure that, yeah, we were able to, um, to do all of this hybrid, uh, which until about um, 10 minutes ago, I was still nervous about. <laughs> um, and we also wanna thank our funders. Uh, so all of this is possible in part because of an initial grant um, that, uh, that Sophie Vasse and I received from the CNRS, um, who made it possible for us to con conceive of the project um, to Northeastern for hosting us um, through funds allocated to health humanities and society and through the assistance provided by the Humanities Center to the Université Paris Cité's LARCA lab and uh, the Person in Medicine Institute, um, who will host us in the second portion uh, in Paris in October. Um, and of course, to Harvard University's Mahindra Center, um, who is welcoming us in person now. I'm also welcoming you on behalf of myself um, and David Jones and Amy Boski, um, who were not able to be here today. Together, we organize um, the seminar of which this is also the culminating meeting, um, the Critical Health Humanities Seminar. So uh, that's a lot of thanks, but we have a lot to be grateful for. And it's just, it's wonderful to be able to have people um, from both sides of the Atlantic here together to have this conversation. Second, for those of you who are here in person, um, I invite you to make the shared space accessible to you, uh, to feel free to move around, put your feet up, to stim, to come out, uh, to go outside, to come back in, to take notes and to use the space in whatever way feels right to you. I also wanted to remind you that we are hosting the symposium in English, um, but our participants and guests speak a variety of languages um, and also represent scholars and practitioners from a variety of disciplines. And so to that end, please speak slowly and deliberately, and please feel free to ask any speaker to repeat or clarify their remarks which is a good reminder for me too. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, we welcome you uh, to ask questions in the chat. If you would keep your um, microphones muted for the duration, that would be great, but we really would love to have this be interactive. Um, I see there are already 33 of you who are joining us virtually. So, um, so please ask questions um, uh, as we go. We welcome you to post and we'll have Professor, uh, we'll have Chris Parsons, um, who's going to be monitoring the chat for us. Mm -hmm. It is such a um, privilege to have all of you here today. So now I'm going to turn to the panel itself. Um, and uh, I think we will begin by uh, having um, Sophie Vasse is going to introduce the speakers who are um, uh, who are from the French side, and I will be introducing our um, American speaker. So I will spotlight Sophie so that you can hear from her as well. Uh, I will actually come next to you. Okay. The okay. So yeah. So why don't you come in into the into the room? And you have the light. What? You have the light. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, I don't have oh, the right Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi, it's, it's so this first panel today is um, Health Humanities and the Health Professions. And it is my great honor to introduce Céline Lefebvre, 
who is an assistant professor in philosophy at the Université Paris-Cité. And she is a member of SPHER, which is the CNRS Unit of History and Philosophy of Science. She is also the co-director of the Institute La Personne en Médecine, a multidisciplinary institute developing uh, humanities and social sciences research in the field of health and medicine. Her main topics are Canguilhem philosophy of medicine, ethics of care in the context of chronicity, and ethics of triage in contemporary medicine. She is particularly involved in the development of medical humanities in medical education. And she is the author of several books, including Devenir médecin, cinéma, formation et soins, becoming a doctor, um, cinema, education and care. And uh, she also has edited several books, including, uh, I'm going to translate directly, Health Humanities, the, engage the Engagement in um, Humanities and Social Sciences in Medicine. She's the co-director of the collection La Personne en Médecine, and she's the member of the editorial board of the collection uh, Questions de Soins, Questions of Care, directed by uh, Frédéric Worms. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, Sil you can read all three. You can just make the introductions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, I think you can do the rest. Please. Okay. Um, second, we'll be welcoming Rita Sharon, um, who is a general internist and literary scholar and one of the founders of the field. If not, I think many of us would say the founder of the field of narrative medicine. She completed her MD at Har here at Harvard. Um, and her PhD in English at Columbia. She is the Bernard Schoenberg Professor of Social Medicine, Professor of Medicine, and the founding chair of the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at Columbia. Her research in narrative medicine has been supported by the NIH, the NEH, and many private foundations. She authored, co-authored, or co-edited four books on narrative medicine, and she lectures and teaches internationally and publishes in leading medical and literary journals. And finally, um, our third speaker will be Solène Lelanger, who is an assistant professor in the history and philosophy of health in medicine at the faculty of the Université Paris-Cité. Her research focuses on the social history of therapeutic agents, which she studies through their production, regulation, and use in care relationships. Uh, she's also interested in medical scandals, mm. medicine, and medical practice in the 20th century, which we'll, we will hear more about, and the production of scientific knowledge, uh, victims of therapeutic injuries, and the forms of their mobilization, of their medical expertise and the ways of influences, especially in conflicts of interest. So Celine, I think we are ready to hear your presentation. And we need to just spot her. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hold, hold on one second. We're just going to spotlight you. Um, uh, yeah, and then you read them. And then I read them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sari and Sophie, for that for your perfect organization of this wonderful symposium. And I wanted to tell you how much I am looking forward to welcome you in Paris in the fall. So in the, first, uh, talk, in the first part of my talk, I will recall some of the reasons, both ancient and current, why the humanities are crucial to medical education. In the second part, I will give some historical landmarks concerning France, while sketching some comparison with the United States. And finally, in the third part, I will discuss, discuss sorry, the current problems facing the teaching of medical humanities in medical education, as well as the objectives to be pursued in the future. So why 
Are medical humanities crucial to the medical education? First of all, I should mention that medical school begins in France in, at the undergraduate level. The students enter the Faculty of Health at the age of 18, and after the first year, they have the opportunity to take the competitive examination to actually start medical school. If they fail, they can retake the competition twice. When I started teaching philosophy to medical students 20 years ago, I observed how the compartmentalization of knowledge, the teaching and assessment methods that, that require more memories and reflection, and the very heavy workload prevent them from stepping back and reflecting on the construction and complexity of knowledge and practices. The curriculum was standardized by hyper specialization and by the model of the academic and hospital career. Companionship during clinical internships certainly allowed the teaching of chronesis, la prudence. However, training already suffered from tense organizations that didn't give students time, energy, or freedom to question the meaning of decision and the values at stake, or to question the practices and behaviors they observed. This companionship was also deployed in a very, in very hierarchical, sorry for this pronunciation, hierarchical relationships, which instead of recognizing the students' abilities and uh, instead of supporting their empowerment and self-esteem, played on devaluation and even humiliation. The context was also the context was also characterized by patriarchal, sexist, and racialized power relations. As a result, the pedagogical relationship, which is yet a paradigmatic form of the care relationship, could be left aside, reduced to learning by imitating peers, or at times transformed into violence. One, if not the primary function of the medical school was to evaluate, prioritize, and sort students, rather than to train and guide them in successful way towards a chosen professional activity. Medical students were far from historical, epistemological, social, or anthropological questions concerning health and medicine. They lacked interdisciplinarity that would, sorry, that would allow them to have a more complex, a more complete, and a more concrete vision of medicine. They lacked collective spaces and times that would allow them to discuss their professional and personal projects. As Catherine Montgomery, among many others describes it, medication is a, a process of complete self-transformation, a true moral education. As Alan Blickley underlines it, it is the adoption of a lifestyle made necessary by young people's early confrontation with the intimacy of lives, bodies, and death. Medical students internalized ways of feeling, thinking, speaking, and acting that distanced them from their own subjective life, their own psychic, cultural, and political life, as well as their distance from subjective lives of patients. Medical students are often as reified, reified as patients. We can link the professional construction of medical students 
and the occultation of the patient's subjectivity, particularly in the hospital, as Georges Cangri, as Georges Canguillem, sorry, described it in his work from the 40s to his death in the 90s. Canguillem explained that one of the challenges of medical practice was to be aware of the history of medical rationality to acknowledge its power as well as its limits and to decentralize the doctor's attention from the disease to the patient's illness. I consider, therefore, that one of the medical humanities' aim was and remains to establish doctors and patients as psychic subjects, social actors, producers of values and knowledge. Of course, my observation was far from new. Reflection of on, sorry, reflections on the contributions, the disciplines, and the method of the humanities in medical education date from the 19th century, if we think, of course, for example, of William Osler. As we know, in the United States, research and training in the medical humanities developed in centers connected to medical schools. The main disciplines were history in the first half of the uh, 20th century, then the social sciences, theology and bioethics in the 60s, literature and narrative medicine, and then cross-cultural and social justice perspectives since the last 20 years. In France, the inclusion of humanities and social sciences in medical studies dates from the early 19th. In this context, the term medical humanities was not used before 2010, and the term health humanities is only slowly emerging. It's, it's only in 2016 that the College of Teachers of Humanities and Social Sciences in Medical School was renamed uh, as the College of Medical Humanities, thus using the Anglo-Saxon terminology. During the first, sorry, during the 15 first years of this development, the medical humanities syllabus have been progressively distung distinguished from medical ethics, which was initially taught by physicians without any training in humanities. This movement has been mainly grounded in France in philosophy, in history and philosophy of sciences, and in social sciences. Therefore, this development contrasted with the Anglo-Saxon primacy of bioethics and then of narrative medicine. From the beginning, the, teacher involves, the teachers involved were aware of the naive and restrictive nature of the objective of humanizing medicine. In this way, it can be said that the teaching of humanities and social sciences in medical education in France, in some ways, were not far from critical medical humanities. This one, um, critical medical humanities, which call for an examination of the way in which health problems are constructed, represented, and governed on different levels, at various scales and in various contexts, various spaces, temporalities, institutions, media, etc., beyond the clinical scene. For French teachers, the inclusion of the humanities in medical education carries with it the critical project of their global and profound refoundation. The history of the humanities and social sciences in faculties of medicine in France is marked by national reforms of medical education programs. Generally speaking, it can be characterized by the gap between, on the one hand, national texts 
prescribing the development of the humanities and social sciences. And on the other hand, the major inadequacy of recruitment of teachers and all the individual struggles carried out by teachers who are by definition isolated in medical schools. Today, less than half of the faculties have a qualified teacher researcher in health humanities in France. Where universities do not have humanities and social science departments or research teams, laboratoires, teaching may still led by doctors without any crucial link to humanities, to humanities research. Here are some key dates in these reforms. In the 90s, humanities and social science were introduced as a comp compulsory subject in the first year of medical school, taking up a significant part of the teaching volume and of the final grades. In 2010, uh, sorry, in 2010, with the licensed master degree system, these subjects became compulsory in the whole of the first cycle, but they remained optional in the second cycle and they were un unequally through, uh, sorry, and they were developed unequally throughout the country. The last reform of these medical studies dates from 2020. First of all, it allowed students from non-medical or non-scientific bachelor degrees to try to enter health and medical studies in order to diversify the recruitment profiles of students. But the number of these students admitted is marginal. Secondly, humanities have been, have been maintained or even reinforced in the first years of the study. Thirdly, they have become compulsory in the second cycle and multidisciplinary courses have been introduced on body, death, discrimination, violence, care in chronic illness and disability, scientific controversy and conflict of interest, which Solène, which we'll talk about in a moment. Fourthly, humanities will soon be able to contribute to the clinical and professional training in the six years of study. In the end, this last reform Make it, makes it possible to build a thoughtful and coherent curriculum in humanities throughout the first six years of study. However, its limitations are still important. First, health humanities are placed at the very beginning of the curriculum. It makes them a selection tool rather than a training tool. Second, it is difficult to make a substantial contribution to clinical training because the assessments of students' clinical skills are not designed to include reflexivity or knowledge of the humanities. Third, distance learning tends to be the answer uh, to, chosen by the medical schools to cope with overcrowding. So faculties are emptying, attendance is no longer considered the norm by students, which creates major problem for teaching the humanities because they require exchange between students and teachers. In the end, specialized matters, mas sorry, specialized ma masters in humanities have been an efficient way to develop health humanities in medical school. There are 20 master's degrees in France. In my third and last part, I will, not, I will now discuss the objectives to be pursued and the projects to be carried out in the future. 
So to this end, I will, I will outline a few elements concerning my own conception of the teaching of humanities in medical education. The work ahead of us concerns actors, methods, and disciplines. Concerning the actors, we need to pacify a counterproductive battlefield. Three types of actors are struggling to articulate. First, medical faculties and clinicians concerned with the evolution of the quality of medical practice but used to define what has to be taught and how it is to be taught. And in the end, with, uh, they are still skeptical of interdisciplinarity. Second, medical humanities teachers and researchers in medical faculty, as we are. And third, medical humanities researchers who are not interested in medical training. As Alan Blique summarizes, the, the, divide, divide, the divide between the biomedical sciences and the humanities has been supplanted by a divide between clinically relevant medical humanities loc located in medical school with translational research programs and academic medical medical Medi sorry, and academic medical humanities located in universities which inter or transdisciplinarity scholar broadening and identity building programs. I think we all have to fight against this sterile, 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 sterile separation. And of course, it should be added that the humanities teaching should be articulated with the teaching given by patients and users themselves, instead of being placed in competition. Concerning the methods, humanities should be involved in new pedagogical methods such as role playing and simulation that in France risk being reduced to ready made recipes. Concerning the disciplines, the contribution of literature and arts are still largely absent and they should be more involved. For me, the inclusion of humanities in medical studies carries with, the, uh, with it the critical project of their global and profound reformation. I believe that the challenge, the challenge is to grasp the unity of the problems related to care. Their challenge, their challenge sorry, is to develop critical teaching that combine clinical ethics with social and political approaches. We must now address the articulation of rela relational issues and social justice issues with political, organizational, and environmental issues. We need to overcome some of our tendencies in the humanities. First, focusing on the ethical risk issues raised by medical technologies and evacuating the political and social dimension of healthcare. And failing to promote the understanding and sensitivity to the lived experience of illness My conception of teaching is grounded on one end on Georges Canguilhem's philosophy of medicine. His philosophy reminds us that illness is part of life. And he defines medicine as a technique or an art which uses science without being reduced to them. Its philosophy questions as well the vital and social values that govern medical knowledge and norms. It is founded on the other hand, on the ethic of care, in particularly as developed by Toronto, Butler or Anne-Marie Moll, when they inscribe medicine in the multiplicity of forms of care that make our lives possible. This allows students to understand the vital and relational nature of care and to situate medicine 
in an interdependent in the interdependent networks of relationships and institutions that extend far beyond the field of health and illness. To conclude, I will, I will take the example of my use of cinema in order to articulate attention, sensitivity, and reflection, and to ally philosophy of medicine, ethics of care, and social sciences. Indeed, some documentary, some documentary and fiction films show points of view, situation, and stories that medicine and health education sometimes leave off screen. I will try to, to share with you some pictures just to, to finish. From Titicat Follies by Weisman to, do you see my, can, Sorry. Can you see my images, my pictures? Oui. Okay. From Titicut Police by Weisman to Deumani, oh my God, I can't. To La Permanence by Alice Diop or Deumani Corporis Fabrica by Castin Taylor and Paravel from Harvard. From Barbarossa for, uh, by Kurosawa to Cleo from Five to Seven by Varda, to The Unknown Girl by Darden Brothers. Some films, when they are considered as work of art and not cut in extracts, in extracts considered as illustrations, make us imagine, feel, and understand the experiences intimate and social of sick people, of their families and caregivers, in and out the time of space of medicine. They allow us, as Conguilhem wished, to project ourselves into the situation of a patient. They also situate clinical situation and relation and ethical problems in the history and context of the lives of sick people. Furthermore, they are, of course, instruments for training oneself to listen to the patient's words and stories. Cinema is one of the means to learn about other stories and other values than one's own, and to vary the points of view and the stories about the care situations encountered. As with Asharon, Martha Nussbaum, and Catherine Montgomery, among other have shown medical and ethical issues are constructed in different ways depending on the narrative that supports them. Finally, cinema is a way to look at the person as a whole, to articulate the general and the particular, and to articulate as critical medical humanities um, wish the difference of scales and issues of care from illness experience to healthcare organization. Thank you so much for your attention. How do I spotlight myself? Um, um, oh, gallery view, you think? And find yourself on this. This is the interpreter. I can do it if you'd like me to. Oh, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, you just have to turn your video on first. Is this? Yes. Do I have, do you have your video on? Okay, yeah. Okay. 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 And I'm going to turn off the captions here just so we can see. Um, ah. 
So hello to those of you at this table and hello to those of you uh, on the screen. Uh, I'm Rita Sharon and I have the privilege of meeting with colleagues from the US and France. Uh, I want to spotlight uh, Dr. Kleinman who is here, who has been my teacher for decades, decades. He has brought me up and uh, not to give you um, uh, responsibility for how I ended up, but we have certainly traveled these roads together. Uh, and, and that Arthur Kleinman is here with us gives us an opportunity to really spotlight what uh, I'm going to retell some of what Professor Lefebvre just said. It is in fact that these hapless medical students uh, without really knowing what they were getting themselves into, are realizing very simply that they too will die. And all of this machinery of equipping them with philosophical ideas and social science ideas and literary ideas and, and, and ethic, uh, ethical ideas and, and questions of justice and equity um, are striving together to help them understand that they too will die and that their task is to accompany patients on that mortal road. Um, uh, just to set up the kinds of things I want to talk about, which are not really um, how one does medical humanities, um, I just want to comment on the divides. Uh, we here at this conference are talking about the, the differences between France's ways of doing medical humanities and the U.S.'s ways of doing medical humanities. They do differ. Uh, we are finding a great deal of similarity and clarity because of how they're different. Um, I don't know that we could have known quite what to do with Professor Lefebvre's uh, um, presentation in the US because there's not like just one way of doing it. And so some of us might've said, oh yes, we must not divide and others might've disagreed <laughs> with some of her prescriptions. So I think this is still um, a very open, permissive um, development of what is in fact a um, um, both a clinical and an intellectual field. Um, I believe the divides, for example, between the United States and the UK are even wider than the divides between France and the, and the US. There's a lot of different divides and many of them have to do with rigor. Um, some of the work in the US, lots of the work in the UK um, amount to kind of arts and health or wellness or, or efforts to simply make the life of the physician or the student a little less um, grinding, which is not the same as an intellectually rigorous um, study of, of humanities and social sciences. So this, I agree, uh, um, Professor Lefebvre, this is one of the real challenges, is how to maintain a distinction between things that we do because we think it'll simply help the kid get through the day versus the efforts to deeply recognize the structural, neoliberal, corporatized, revenue uh, uh, um, concentrating parts of mainstream medicine. These are the things that we mostly have to now keep in our sights. Um, and we're not gonna help the kids feel better by giving them some extra, you know, yoga, uh, without paying attention to the deep structural corporate economic issues that are at the at the uh, uh, root of it. Um, and finally, we can't forget about the hospitals because the medical schools are empires and the hospitals are empires. And unless we can alter the ways in which the hospitals and those who work in them 
value uh, different aspects of healthcare, our poor medical students will learn one thing in our hands and then we'll feel, we'll feel betrayed when they get to the hospital and nobody believes them. The what? The patient's story, what? And they think that we've just lied to them, see? So, so many, many ways of unity um, are needed. But already in this, in this, um, um, in our seminar yesterday, we did learn about and we heard about the exploitation, for example, of um, uh, the exploitation of physicians who um, who train abroad and then try to come to the U.S. to practice, and the ways in which they end up being exploited by the American system to simply get the work done in hospitals as very poorly paid interns and residents. Uh, we will learn in a minute from Soled about uh, the collusion between pharma and the prescribers in, in using medicines of uncertain value. Um, and we did learn yesterday of practices like spa medicine and traditional Chinese medicine that are completely outside of the remit of mainstream medical, uh, Western medicine, and yet um, are beneficial to the, to the health of, of patients. So this is what we've already been doing together. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna turn to things that we've been doing. I'm at Columbia, I've been at Columbia for a long time. And we have managed over the years um, by starting with faculty. I was determined at the beginning, I didn't wanna start by teaching the medical students. I wasn't gonna do that. I got some money from different foundations and, and uh, government agencies. And I started teaching faculty why this is important uh, for years. And I trained a group of faculty who were now able to do adequate work with the medical students as they're teaching them uh, in, in, uh, in school and in the clinics. Um, and, and there are a number of, of um, benefits uh, to this because the actual work is being done by not the students, but by the physicians and nurses and social workers. Um, so our, pro our program at Columbia has really focused on training of um, many different subspecialties, pediatricians, palliative care doctors, um, ophthalmologists, OBGYN, um, with the effort to shift the institutional ethos Ultimately, we've been at it for years and it's certainly not there yet, but, but, but trying at a, a, a level higher than just the, uh, in our case, 22 year old who begins medical school. Um, we, we do give credit and we do allow students to um, specialize in the humanities and narrative medicine. And, and they have, all the students have to do scholarly projects and students, some 15, 20% of them will do a sustained scholarly project in either narrative medicine or social medicine. And they learn how to do qualitative research and they learn, uh, some of them do, do uh, creative work as their projects. There are novels, there are films. So this, this helps to show that uh, there is a life in medicine with these specialties. And finally, we have recently um, um, adopted and even introduced the notion of abolition medicine, which is uh, according to W.B. Du Bois uh, a long time ago, uh, described abolition democracy as not just dealing with the plantation and the post plantation and the reconstruction and Jim Crow, but indeed, taking racial justice as the ground. And we, do, we can do that, we ought to, we need to do that in, in medicine, certainly, as well as in uh, post-slavery, yes? So we're talking about abolition medicine, we're trying to teach it. Um, so part of the inquiry, as I've described it, um, um, Part of the inquiry that we're trying to encourage in our students is both 
the inquiry of science and the inquiry of the humanities. And when persons grumble about the reductionism and the subspecialization and patients become their organs and um, is there a way to take these yes. things out of the way? Um, if, if there's, thank you. Um, so that the science itself, the discovery itself of science is, is very, very different from, oh, you're a cardiologist and you don't care about the lungs, right? Or, or I don't want to hear that. I'm not a psychiatrist. Go talk to somebody else. It's not that. The discovery, the inquiry in the basic <laughs> sciences is as um, guided by uncertainty and doubt as is any kind of aesthetic discovery. There's no difference between the aesthetics of the scientist and the aesthetics of the artist. Sorry, help me learn that in talking about C.P. Snow. She says, no, 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 Snow had it wrong. Um, so that's what I'm gonna take the rest of my time to talk about with you. Um, I've gotten uh, NIH funding to do a series of interviews with our scientists at Columbia. And now we're starting outside of Columbia to say, I mean, tell me a little bit about your science, but tell me what has brought you to your discoveries. Um, tell me about the kinds of inquiry, the kinds of invention. Where did the ideas really pop in your mind? How did you then follow them? And I'm just gonna tell you about one person um, this is Garrett Fitzgerald. He's a molecular biologist. He's very well known. He's a Penn. He's very well known as the person who proved, I mean, his, his, um, his long research showed that aspirin is able to prevent um, uh, ischemic heart disease. This was his work. This is Garrett Fitzgerald. And then later, He's the one who forced the FDA to stop selling a pain medicine, the COX-2 inhibitors, Celebrex, remember when those were put up? That was his work uh, to the great dismay of the FDA and the people who made Celebrex and Vioxx, remember? So, so he's got a real, a real uh, track record in changing the practice of medicine. He's now interested in molecular clocks those things in the body, it's not just sleep-wake cycles, but um, um, infectious disease, en uh, endocrine, uh, immunology, all of these systems have diurnal variations and they're temporally connected to one another. And he's trying to show that the molecular clocks are synchronized. And when synchronized, can... In, not encourage, but continue health. And when the molecular clocks get dis-synchronized, um, as he says, now I'm gonna tell you how he told me this. He's, descri he's describing the molecular clocks. Um, he says they play a fundamental role in integrating tissue function. And when they break down, there would be manifest a real metabolic and immunologic dysfunction. And when he talked to me in, in the interview, he says, as we get older, the center does not hold. Things fall apart. So I think many of us around the table will know that he's quoting Yeats. This is the second coming, 1919. And, and remember, it, uh, I mean, it may not be as, as um, known to, to our, our, our French colleagues, but it's, it's uh, um, 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 turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center does not hold. Now, this was stunning to me. Now, he's, he's an Irishman, and, and they are very close to their own tradition but it's not as if he's only available to his, his own um, culture. The point is that his poetic tutelage struck me as an example of what we've called now embodied aesthetics, which is a recent development of the longer project called embodied cognition, which I hope is familiar to some of you. 
Embodied cognition, it's sometimes called the four E's. Um, this is the work starting in the early 90s, um, where um, at the time, cognitive science thought only that the brain was a computer, a really swell computer, and could do all kinds of calculations. And, and um, But they held to this kind of mechanistic calculator. And then they started identifying particular brain functions that the particular brain structures that did particular things, right? Oh, the state of attention, that's governed by the anterior cingulate gyrus. And next, you know, and what lights up on the fMRI? So, so then psychologists and philosophers, including phenomenologists, came to remind us that cognition is not only a part of brain activity, uh, but is an embodied state of being. I mean, it's so, I, I feel funny even stating uh, what feels so obvious, um, but that, that the body is necessary for thought and that it's through the body and its speech and its voice that we make contact with what we consider to be real. Um, they call it the four E's because it's embodied. It's embedded individual organisms, us. We are embedded in the world. We're not passive, de de uh, 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 um, uh, you know, uprooted um, observers, but rather we're really part of the world that's out there. We're embroiled in it. We're not deracinated. We enact with this universe, we change it, we know that. And yet the, the model of the brain as computer would refuse to admit that. So we enact our universe. Um, we extend ourselves toward other persons, toward other phenomena. We get beyond our own membranes to recognize others, to collaborate with others, to get immersed in one another's work, to swap consciousnesses, which is not only a form of thought, but a form of intersubjective contact and a form of love. So all of these ways in which the in which Merleau-Ponty was right and Husserl and Heidegger before him, right? And, and that this has taken root among even the neuroscientists who are now studying music and they're now studying the, the cinema that, that we heard of uh, uh, just before um, toward some understanding of how indeed our aesthetic functions and skills and, and, and sensitivities may indeed help us think our thoughts, okay? Now, Fitzgerald is, a, is an Irishman and of course Yeats came to hand for him, but this is not to suggest that that we have only our own culture's heritage to, to go after. And I think a point of the medical humanities very simply is to bring other forms of art, of other forms of, of cultural product to bear on any one student or, or clinician. So this is the radicalized version of embodied cognition that 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 you realize the power of choice and that you can expand the range of what may alter your own foundational thought. Remember, we're talking about discovery and where the thoughts come from. And they're not just going to come from Yates. They're going to come from Claudia Rankin and they're going to come from Cydia Hartman and they're going to come from Octavia Butler in ways in which those sources will then bring to us forms of thought and knowledge and connection to cultures beyond our own. Um, so I thought that abolition medicine may well proceed into abolition cognition, which is forms of thought that include more than our own lineage. Um, so here's Miller ponty writing in Phenomenology of Perception. We must therefore recognize as an ultimate fact, this open and indefinite power of giving significance, that is both of apprehending and conveying a meaning by which man transcends himself towards a new form of behavior or towards other people 
or towards his own thought through his body and his speech. Do you see the radicality of that? That, that, that he is simply stating that, that man, and by now maybe he would say they and not he, um, can get beyond the membranes of the skin. Um, it, 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 it sounds to me like, like Meloponti is getting beyond describing, this is not something regressing toward the small, you know, a mise en abîme in literary scholarship. Ce n'est pas un mise en abîme, c'est un mise en ouverture. Huh? That it just gets bigger and bigger. And that's the legacy of, of not just Mailer Ponty, but of the phenomenologists uh, themselves. Um, okay, I think, I think I'm getting to the end of my time. Um, the part about embodied aesthetics that speaks to me as a general internist seeing patients is the insistence on aesthetics as not being simply reduced to what's in a museum or what's collectible or what the New York Philharmonic is playing, but rather that the aesthetics includes, and this is the works of Mark Johnson, patterns, images, feelings, qualities, and emotions by which meaning is possible for us in all aspects of our lives. So that's what it is that we are hoping for our students, our faculty, and also our patients to be able to bring with them in their courses through illness. Um, and narrative medicine as a field has found ways to help clinicians do that, to help clinicians expand their own capacity to attend, uh, um, to, to, to listen radically, to listen without being hampered by one's own uh, prejudices, one's own biases, one's own limits, but rather to listen, I tell them, listen dumbly. <laughs> Don't listen as if you know what's going to happen next. And, and this radical listener has to be humble in knowing that he or she knows nothing about the other person to start with that level of, of, of humility and refusing to totalize the patient as if you know about them already. And we do that through helping them learn how to read and write and watch movies and in, in, imbibe, absorb that which can come to them. And this eventually leads to a kind of affiliation with patients that is otherwise very difficult to achieve. When a patient finally understands that, yes, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you. A patient said to me once, every time, every time I drink something, it goes right through me. I say to him, you mean you feel like a metal pipe? And he says, how did you know? And I said, you just told me, see? So I will stop there. We have a lot of things to talk about. Um, la langue, la langue is both the language and the tongue. <laughs> Let me stop there. Oh, uh, well, oh, perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, let me move. To, let me move this. But, but you can stay here. Yeah. I have also the, the uh, video. Yes, I have the video. Are you? But you're not in this screen. So yes. Let me just. There we go. Okay. There we are. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a lot of uh, <laughs> a slide. Um, thank you for uh, uh, bringing me the opportunity to speak uh, mm -hmm. uh, today. Uh, it's not easy after Celine and uh, Rita, but uh, uh, it's uh, in the game uh, to speak uh, last of <laughs> this panel. Um, I uh, so I am Solène Lélinger, and uh, in this uh, contribution, I want to question how health humanities can be based on the dynamics 
of uh, important reconfiguration in the health fields and how this uh, reconfiguration lead to uh, rethink the uh, training of health professional. I would like to draw uh, on part <coughs> a particularly uh, instructive case study uh, that I work on during my PhD thesis about a French dr drug scandal. This uh, scandal not only led to a reform of the uh, drug regulation, but also opened uh, the way to a stricter uh, supervision, supervision of practices uh, and to strategies to limit the influence of pharmaceutical industry uh, in different fields, uh, including the training of uh, students uh, joining a reflection carried out on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, over the past decades, a uh, few decades, drugs have become central in the healthcare process, both as therapeutic and uh, dangerous products. Mm. It's not uncommon to hear on the news uh, specific product or a therapeutic agent uh, described as unsafe because of its uh, apparently unknown uh, dangerous side effects. This phenomenon is not new, but uh, it raises question as uh, to uh, the social uh, negotiation of drug risks and the transmission of historical memory, if there is one, in uh, contemporary uh, science. In uh, uh, 2009, the French drug, uh, uh, the French regulatory uh, agency withdrew the uh, Banflurex uh, mediator in uh, tr uh, trade name from the market due uh, to its cardiopulmonary uh, side effects. This drug, uh, commercialized by uh, the French uh, company uh, Laboratoire Servier in the uh, 1970s, was used to treat uh, diabetes and high cholesterol. It was also prescri prescribed uh, off-label as a weight loss drug uh, during uh, the last year of uh, its commercialization. The French mediator scandal uh, resulted in a complete change uh, in regulation and an uh, interna internal reorganization of uh, the French drug safety policies. At first sight, it seems to be a classic withdrawal of an old drug for which the benefit risk balance uh, is, has been uh, reassessed. In reality, uh, several stages uh, precede the constitution of the scandal due to the mobilization of some actor uh, gave uh, visibility to this unnoticed uh, withdrawal. Uh, first, the whistleblower testimony and involvement in the identification and quantification of uh, victims. Uh, then uh, the first estimates of uh, number of deaths uh, uh, first unofficial and then official uh, uh, estimates. And uh, third, the media uh, relay of those uh, results. In uh, this uh, process of scandal development, uh, there was a desire to understand the sequence of events that had uh, maintained the mediator uh, on the French market. Political reports were written by the Parliament, and uh, the Inspection Générale des Affaires Sociales, the Inspectorat General of Social Affairs, which looked closely at decisions uh, made by the agency experts during the commercialization period of uh, Banflurex, and show dysfunction of drug regulation. At uh, the same time, Several leg legal proceedings were uh, initiated, uh, individual uh, civil proceedings. Uh, there is no possibility of class action uh, at this time and uh, criminal proceedings. Irene Frachon, the whistleblower, uh, asked uh, for a reform of French law uh, inspired by the American model of uh, class action. 
This affair uh, may seem to be an isolated case, yet uh, when we uh, examine it from an international point of view, the case of Benfluorex is intrinsically uh, related to that of certain amphetamine derivatives, mm -hmm. uh, the fenfluramine. Indeed, uh, not only uh, do uh, fenfluramine have the same side effects as benfluorex, but they were also developed by the same company. They are uh, well known in uh, the United States as a part of a diet cocktail named fenfen, which caused valvular heart disease and uh, constituted a great scandal uh, in the beginning on, uh, of the uh, 20s. Political uh, report revealed some incongruities uh, in the uh, re, um, retaining of mediator on the French market when other amphetamine derivatives were removed. Surprisingly, it was not seen as an anorexic, anorectic agent. Mm -hmm. uh, amphetamine and fenfluramine was uh, banned, uh, and some other molecules like uh, benfluorex uh, were just restricted, but uh, the two were not seen as being uh, related. Through the laboratory, uh, laboratory Servier was developing uh, the two drugs simultaneously mm -hmm. uh, and compared their activity uh, during the research. They were promoted in two very different, different ways, fenfluramine as anorectic uh, agent and uh, benfluorex as a treatment of metabolic disorder, mm -hmm. uh, particularly diabetes. This is in response to the first results of the Framingham Art Studies, uh, highlighting uh, the impact of some risk factor in uh, cardiovascular disease, particularly the role of metabolic disorders. The main interpretation proposed following uh, the withdrawal of the mediator is the failure of the regulatory system of the drug agency, but also, and above all, the strategy of the industry. Although other points were uh, seen uh, as ways for improvement, such as post-marketing surveillance, uh, the issue of conflict of interest has mainly received attention in uh, a political uh, desire for transparency. The uh, intention of the French Minister of Health at this time, Xavier Bertrand, was to introduce a Sunshine Act à la Française, uh, so a French Sunshine Act, uh, as he said uh, uh, on radio, inspired by the American model of uh, the Physician Payment Sunshine right. Act, adopted in um, uh, 2010 and uh, instituted uh, three years later as part of the health reform uh, led by Barack Obama, uh, obliging pharmaceutical industry and medical uh, devices company to declare any sum or gift exceeded uh, $10 uh, dollar granted to a doctor or medical uh, institution to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Service. Within the framework of uh, a research project on conflict of interest in medicine with uh, uh, Christian Bona, we uh, question the emergence of framing in terms of conflict of interest in the context of uh, the mediator scandal and uh, how it uh, grow up in all of this report uh, from Parliament uh, and so. And uh, we have shown that uh, conflict of interest are uh, structurally normalis normalis normalized in a pharma, pharma, pharma physician relationship. Instead of uh, seeing a structural problem, it is an isolated case that will be uh, pointed out, uh, especially in the uh, trial, um, uh, where uh, we uh, look just at some people from the agency who uh, was linked to uh, the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry. It's very, it's this man that had uh, 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 conflict of interest. 
Uh, but it's not seen as a global uh, problem. There is a, thus the devices put in place will focus on indivi this uh, individual transgression rather than uh, solving an uh, overall problem. The consequences in terms of regulation are uh, one thing, but uh, what are the implications for practices? With Christian Bonnard, uh, we wondered uh, uh, whether these means of uh, framing would uh, not be attempt at management rather than a real solution. No considering the uh, inbuilt practices and in particular, the question of uh, integrating a critical mindset relating to this issue uh, initially. In other words, to go beyond a, a platform a website, uh, uh, gathering financial information. When French medical students are asked today uh, if media to your, uh, mean something uh, to them, uh, for almost of them, it's it is just a vague memory briefly evoked uh, by a teacher, uh, whereas it is uh, the biggest uh, health scandal at the last few, few years, whose uh, appear uh, trial is currently underway. Mm -hmm. uh, it, well, I have uh, two weeks ago, a group of uh, 20 students, when, when I ask, uh, do you know the mediator? One student make like that. Uh, so it's, um, it's not really present uh, in their uh, uh, teaching. Um, much uh, can be learned from this uh, case of study for medical students and more generally health students, including students for other uh, disciplines as well. Besides raising the question of conflict of interest within regulatory bodies, the scandal has brought to the uh, forefront, the question of the, the influence of pharmaceutical industry on prescribers. Well documented for many years, the mediator uh, case have, uh, has given a visibility for this notion uh, and to um, uh, associative mobilization. In his uh, PhD thesis in educational sciences, uh, Paul Schaeffer was interested in the possible teaching of medical students about independence from the pharmaceutical industry. Focusing on the French case, Paul Schaeffer studies the emergence of this issue, uh, particularly in the United States, and he, I, I thought it uh, would be interesting during this uh, symposium to uh, go uh, also uh, uh, beyond a comparative uh, perspective and question also the transfers uh, yeah. that, take, that right. take place. Uh, specific, uh, specifically, he refers to the mobilization of the American Medical Students Association, uh, AMSA, um, since uh, 2007, uh, ranked American medical school according to their official uh, policy, uh, for example, about, uh, from the, as they took the website, for example, to uh, see if uh, there is a uh, official policy about uh, the conflict of interest or uh, influence uh, for, uh, towards the pharmaceutical industry. He explains that uh, the ranking is based on uh, 14, 14 yes, criteria, which determine a score according to uh, the degree of involvement in the approaches, uh, exemplary, moderate, or absent, undertaken uh, for each of them. Uh, an exemplary approach may go uh, uh, so far as to advocate a ban uh, uh, on a criterion uh, in question, each of uh, which concern the entire uh, faculty community, students, teachers, faculty leaders. While most uh, uh, faculty were uh, graded uh, F as the lowest grad uh, in the first ranking, uh, Paul Schaeffer reports that in uh, 2014, uh, two uh, thirds 
our faculty was graded A, a or B, uh, res uh, corresponding to exemplary or moderate, uh, respectively, uh, including also uh, hospitals in this ranking. And it was the case, for example, for Harvard, who had uh, increased uh, uh, the score uh, between the two uh, uh, studies. It uh, also raises in the need to have not only a policy of influence management, but also sanction in case of non-application of this policy, which have been studied. Paul Schaeffer was also a member of the Formandet, an association uh, campaigning for the independence of uh, medical training and information and published uh, with them a ranking of faculty based on the American model for French faculty. Always um, in the uh, continuity of the mediator scandal and the attention paid of the problem of uh, the influence of indust industry, initiative uh, to raise awareness of this issue first came from medical students who, uh, inspired by American students, wrote an information uh, booklet as uh, this, uh, I don't know, right? Uh, that was massively distributed to uh, students. And it was uh, a small uh, small book to uh, we'll put in the, in the pocket. Yeah, in the pocket. It was just the, the size for the pocket. And um, uh, uh, however, since the students' mandate uh, in the National Association of Medical Students in France is uh, um, only for one year, it is difficult to mobilize, to mobilize them over long yeah. term. Yeah. Nevertheless, uh, some uh, modest changes have been made. The most significant is the establishment of the Ethic and Deontology Charter, la Charte Ethique et Deontology, um, uh, set up by the uh, conference of deans, the all deans of all uh, French uh, medical faculty uh, uh, sit around and uh, decided. Uh, and, um, uh, and it was, uh, 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 it was made in uh, 2017. This charter go beyond the framework of a link of interest and integrates other dimension of ethics, such as scientific integrity and uh, plagiarism, for example. Of it, uh, if it uh, imposes, I, I put uh, compulsory teaching of ethics and uh, deontology, it doesn't it doesn't specify the uh, contour, uh, no time volume uh, or framework for this. Uh, 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 formation. The result is that uh, these courses vary great when it's uh, there. There is courses vary greatly from one faculty to another, um, and uh, are often uh, taught by physicians without any support of a teacher of health humanities. Yeah. And um, the picture uh, I I I. Uh, I uh, put uh, here is uh, one. Uh, it's uh, near an elevator in our uh, medical faculty in Paris. The the paper is uh, the chart uh, that uh, must be uh, put on the uh, university, uh, but it's uh, it's in a corridor uh, in a dark side, <laughs> and and I I see this uh, when I go uh, in, in uh, teaching <laughs> and uh, it was interesting for me so the that uh, huge uh, 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 something I think it's really important for medical students who are just put there and yeah. nobody cares uh, to so I arrive to my conclusion. Uh, the mediator scandal has uh, highlighted a certain number of dysfunction, notably on the question of the proximity between industry and yeah. politician, but also uh, on their influence on uh, health professionals yeah. from the beginning of uh, their training. Uh, 
The management of this problem, which are not specific to France, has benefited from the transfer of mechanism uh, applied in uh, the United States. However, the effectiveness of this mechanism, mechanism can be a uh, question. More generally, in the uh, arrangement uh, made for a future health professional, it is uh, regrettable that health humanities have not been more uh, fully integrated into the critical uh, thinking training provided by the French uh, faculty. Uh, also, uh, the teachers have uh, expressed uh, requests in this regard. Uh, for example, with the Collège des Humanités Médicales. The result is that the training uh, that has been put in place is based on local initiative uh, that must constantly be uh, defended. While our discipline provides tools for under understanding uh, this uh, issue. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> So I think we're gonna um, we're gonna to uh, have a little bit more time. We got a little bit of a late start, so we'll continue to about six, and then uh, and then we'll have um, a break for dinner then. So, uh, Yes, please. And and please introduce yourself. Um, yeah. My name is Rosemary Dolly, and I am the, the chair of the Vice Chair of Literature and Human Rights at Penn State. Um, my accent is because I'm from Hiroshima. I'm from the last one, so I'll take that to the end. Maybe in the last one. I wanted to ask Rita about this question, or that to continue the discussion more, about this question, or that to continue the discussion more, Rita, not so much as to ask. That when you incite um, things fall apart, it's uh, almost automatic for those of us who work in African literature to go to our Chevy station. Sure, of course. Right? And so then I come to the question about um, abolition medicine, mm -hmm. because one of the issues I've had in teaching uh, rural humanities uh, medical students in KwaZulu Natal, out of the Nelson Royce Lacha Mandela Medical School, is that. They come from uh, communities where their um, idea of the human it has always been interdependent, in, uh, inter um, dependency and um, inter responsibility between the human and non human world and the environment. Ah. deep Ubuntu. And so, yes. one of the yes. things that happens when you, and Ubuntu is not exceptional in indigenous belief systems, this would count for Aboriginality in. Um, Algonquin and also in, for example, the um, north of um, the, uh, the Carpentaria Peninsula of Australia. So when we come to this, I'm thinking about the ways in which even if we're trying to do what uh, you have termed ab uh, abolition medicine, we're still dealing with the Western notion of the human. And so the two things that happen there is we're suddenly importing the split between, the Cartesian split between the brain and the body that you referred to mm -hmm. as the brain, br brain as machine, yeah. which was never in those communities to begin with. But there's a rapid adaptation with it because there's an association of it with modernity, mm -hmm. which is many of the reasons why people go into that medical school yeah. in the first place and yeah. so I'm not understanding like if we go to Sylvia Winter or we go to the other Grussvogel or the other black critical theorists mm -hmm. you know it seems to me that until we import our own critique of the western human into our mm -hmm. medical education all we're do, doing is um, you know in our medical education even though it is human it's western humanities and mm -hmm. we're um, uh, re- establishing a, a neo-colonial educa mm -hmm. medical education, even though we never set out to yeah. do that. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, what can I say? I mean, you, you do the best you can. Yeah. And you're right that we are consigned to what we were incul inculcated with, and it is acts of will that might force one of us voluntarily 
out from that paradigm. Um, I, ha I have much more modest expectations of the human than it sounds like you do. Um, but I think what we can do as teachers, educators, and forget the, I mean, it doesn't matter that it's medicine. What, what we can do is um, what I was calling radical humility. And to say, we know nothing about um, um, even ourselves. And we know nothing. We have only that which we have been given by faulty uh, um, teachers. Yes? Now that's a radical leap. And so we're talking not just about educators or pedagogy. We're talking about um, deep, profound, not even psychoanalytic necessarily, um, sources of the self. I mean, go to Charles Taylor or someone like that. Yeah, it's it's just, kind of sources of the self. self. Sources of the self within a particular. Well, yeah. So, so how how does one escape one's? I'm not going to say roots. Um, you can't escape your roots, but but it doesn't have to encourage that one folks who don't come from those roots. That was yeah. my own. Well, no, and and, and I and I think your question begs the answer of what we have been trying not to call global health, exactly. but that's the but what was the other uh, planetary and planetary health taking on all the attributes that, of neocolonialism. Yeah, yeah. So maybe so maybe we have to achieve still another um archimedal uh, uh position in order for our lever to work. Thank you. Steve. Very hard. It is. Sorry, take time. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I have um, a question for Celine and Solen. Um, uh, several questions, I suppose, about the distinction between the French system and the US system. Um, and so my question for Celine, because um, you spoke about exams um, in the French medical schools, um, and uh, I'm curious, so um, I don't know if this is something our French colleagues know, but in, in the US, there was um, a recently a major change in the exam structure, um, and it was caused by student agi agitation yeah. um, that um, made the first qualifying exam, um, step one, USMLE step one, pass fail. Um, and part of the agitation behind that had to do, I think, with the relationship between the medical school curriculum and the um, expensive test prep system yes. Yes. that um, people uh, end up relying on heavily in order to get high scores on these tests. Um, so I'm curious if there's any sort of parallel in the French system, um, like if, if because um, it sounded very much like the um, medical school system was sort of all encompassing in France. And I wonder if there are external sources yeah, sure. um, that students are turning to to uh, try to pass these exams, or if that's just an American thing. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Kim Adams. I'm a postdoc at Penn State. Um, uh, yeah, um, and the, I'm not at the medical campus, though. I don't know if you're there. Um, okay. Okay, cool. So I'm I'm in the humanities humanities institute. Um, yeah. Um, so so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. Could you cut? Uh, because I, I'm thinking of. Uh, I know it's really late in in France, and yeah, there's something that, uh, uh, clear for me. I don't know if it was clear for Selina and Solette. You said there was agitation about the first medical exam. Yes. And what happened to that exam? So that exam, um, it used to be that the score you got on that exam essentially determined your residency placement. Okay. Um, so, so the next like, step. It's like the internet exam. Um, but um, what happened was that exam was made pass-fail. 
because of okay. the student agitator. Sophie, tu peux résumer la question? So, thank you so much, but and Sophie will uh, summarize the question. Oui, uh, Céline, j'arrive. <laughs> so, ce que j'ai compris, c'est qu'il y a eu uh, des mouvements étudiants qui se sont opposés à la culture uh, du, du, de l'examen qui correspond a priori, you become a resident after that exam, mm -hmm. à l'internat où en fait, comme en France, selon la note que tu avais, tu choisissais ta spécialité. But today, it's pass-fail. So then students choose their specialty, how? Their, their residency, according to a different question. system. Is brand new? So, oh, right. They're, they're forced to show their own specialness. Okay. And Donc, they have to research okay. publications. All right. Donc maintenant, pour euh, l'internat, il y a cet examen et c'est euh, pass ou fail, d'accord Tu l'as ou tu ne l'as pas. Et ensuite, tu dois, tu dois pour euh, justifier ta discipline d'internat, oui. avoir une sorte de motivation qui est argumentée, mais qui est aussi euh, appuyée sur un dossier où tu as des publications, des engagements oui. dans une discipline. Yes. Et elle se demandait si la culture de test prep, la, la culture un peu ouais. de prépa, mm -hmm. influençait aussi euh, la formation médicale. Thank you so much, Sophie. Solène will uh, complete my answer, but the, the last reform, the one of uh, 2020, uh, is going into this, uh, this new tendency. We, we are um, the Minister of the Superior. Uh, sorry, the research and the universities, they, they wanted to go uh, and to copy the, the American model, uh, but it's not, um, it's, we, we, we don't have the same model, but uh, the, the, there is two, two changes. The first one is uh, at the beginning of the, um, of the studies, it has changed and now, Uh, before the, the, the students uh, uh, were stuck in, in, uh, in the first year, they, they only can stay two years to prepare the concours, the examination to enter into the medical school. And it was a wasting of time, of energy. So it has been changed. And now the model is more like in the States with three first years of training, of opening, opening the minds and uh, to offer the possibilities to, uh, to go to, to other licenses in other right. disciplines. And the second change is about this uh, concours, the, the one you mentioned, uh, the, the colleague mentioned, and uh, we, um, it is not abolished, it still exists. But the, the reform tries to, uh, to complete this with a professional project. But, ah, but the, the, the rank, and Solène will complete me, but the rank is still deciding of what we are, of what the students are going to be. If they are going to be uh, surgeons or radiologists, or uh, it, it's still very. Uh, Uh, important and yeah. what our problem is um, more generally is that this examination this concours even it, it has been changed and uh, it's better it is the way we have to conceive our lessons our uh, teachings and uh, it's uh, uh, comment tu dirais Sophie un carcan It's a modern, mm -hmm. it's a norm, it's a, norm. It's a frame. It's training. Yeah. And, uh, and it has not changed from this point of view. Well, but uh, I just add uh, something uh, that um, with the, this reform, uh, it's not just knowledge, who, uh, which is important. It's also uh, savoir-être. And uh, I know, yes, uh, they have some, uh, Céline mentioned the simulation. Uh, now they have um, uh, 
uh, it is uh, the next year it become uh, national. All students uh, have to uh, there. There is a, a standardized uh, departure standardized uh, patients yes. mm -hmm. and. Uh, they have to uh, make uh, uh, to to make a faire une consultation quoi. Uh, uh, it's, it's a role playing of uh, an, uh, uh, someone uh, physician and a patient, uh, but the patient has uh, uh, something to uh, learn and. Uh, it's really uh, framed, but it's uh, it's to uh, to to evaluate the uh, if uh, the students is uh, 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 could uh, interact with the patient and how he give uh, some uh, uh, information. But we are we are not uh, included. <laughs> To the, uh, uh, the this structure, uh, it's only uh, led by physician, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit a bit weird when I was asked for being a simulated patient, and uh, I saw that we uh, could uh, add a lot of uh, skills uh, to students mm -hmm. to uh, for this new. Uh, uh, exam, but we are not included. Uh, it's right by our physician. Should we turn her, her hand up? Should we include her from the? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. 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 oh um, I know two Karens. I, I, I <laughs> this is totally my fault. Um, I, if you wanted to follow up, though, what, let's take the follow up and then we'll take Karen Thornberry. I think that um, the simulated patient story is so interesting, right? Because the whole idea of gender education is so incredible. Yes. Right, right. 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 And yeah, the whole point is that patients are not standard. Yes. yes. And so, um, can't tell you, Janelle Taylor, who used to be here in the state of Washington and is now at the University of Toronto, was starting a project on exactly that issue. Um, and I don't know what ever happened, but she's a brilliant anthropologist. I mean, it could be really interesting mm -hmm. to you know, look, look into it. So, sorry, that's all. Thank you. Um, should we? Yes. All right, yeah. I'm sorry, okay, are... I, I can't hear because I, I can't see the, the of I course see the no. because I, I, I understood uh, that uh, this, it was a pretty size of uh, standardized patients, right? And I, 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 yeah, I, so there, there was a, um, that there's some work uh, being done oh, yeah. um, about, uh, about the problem oh. of the standardized patient as a kind, which is yeah. so antithetical um, to the, Whole sort of ethos of the um, of the health humanities, um, yeah. and and the recommendation was uh, for a, um, a scholar named Janelle Taylor, uh, who's now at Toronto, um, doing some work on on the problem of the standardized patient. Is that she was starting a project? I just don't know whatever. Happened. Yeah, she she was starting a project, but we're unclear um, where it stands. So um, yeah, thank you okay. so much. So Karen Thornberg. Yes. And then can you can you. Can you hear her? Um, I uh, yes, Karen. I think you're. Uh, I think you're. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm. Uh, you can, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. So thank you. These are our three just amazing presentations and um, just amazing. So uh, I have a very quick question uh, for Celine, and I I really appreciated the uh, comprehensive discussion of medical humanities in France because I'm of course quite familiar with the U.S. Uh, China, Arthur Kleinman, David Jones, and I did a, a trip to China some years ago to work with practitioners of medical humanities. I've worked with practitioners of medical humanities in Taiwan, Korea, and so forth, not France. So I, I really appreciated that. And it's, it's fascinating to put that in comparative context. My question uh, regards what kind of uh, training or what kind of, um, yeah, what kind of training do the medical humanities in France offer uh, to uh, physicians, aspiring physicians, to take into consideration uh, the large immigrant 
uh, population in mm. France. And I ask this for several reasons, not the least of which is that uh, I do not have the privilege of teaching Harvard Medical School students, but I do teach a lot of pre-med, several hundred a year now. And they are just, um, you know, we, we do literature and, and medicine and tackle different issues through literature. And not only are they floored by the perspectives that literature can offer uh, into medicine, and they become convinced that, yeah, science is good for medicine, but it's not everything, right? But even more than that, or I would, I would say maybe just as much as that, uh, we look at works from around the world and mm -hmm. the different cultural perspectives, right. the different ways of thinking about illness. Right. Um, so, you know, and I think that's a hugely important part of their training too, because even if they are from another culture, they're maybe familiar with that culture and United States culture, um, just by virtue of being in the Harvard classroom, but they don't really know much about what's going on elsewhere mm -hmm. and so forth. So I would just be really curious you know, what kind of training are the medical humanities offering uh, in France uh, to uh, better prepare physicians uh, to deal with a really multicultural uh, post-colonial uh, population? So thanks so much for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I can, uh, I can say that uh, is, it is not so ideal that 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 you <laughs> that you think um, where there are social sciences, uh, I think there is a, a lot of uh, teachings uh, about social inequalities since a long time ago, but it can be uh, or it has been very I think very general and very theoretical, and uh, it has to change. Uh, and uh, it is not so um, uh, so focused on the immigrate population or the migration, and right. uh, it's a lack. And uh, uh, my second answer will be that this is the first, I, I am so ashamed, this is the first year that we have a compulsory uh, courses about discrimination mm -hmm. in this uh, new uh, teaching, uh, we uh, speak about races or uh, or um, migrations, or um, but it's it, it is the beginning of the beginning, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and you have to imagine that the volume, the number of hours is uh, it's very marginal, so mm -hmm. that, that's why our exchange is very important as well because we yep. have to plead uh, plaider tu dirais comment sophie plaider plead yes we have to plead with the help of other medical schools uh, to convey our conference of dean but um, uh, this is a, a very important uh, thing because uh, the medical the profiles of the medical students or the nurse students are changing a lot, and the, 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 the social uh, profiles are, are more mixed now. It's more feminine, of course, and very mixed. So thank you so much for this question. Oh, thank you. That's great. Thank you. We have two more questions in the chat, but maybe there is a question in the room first. Okay. So yeah. I think just that just maybe one. we'll just have the two questions go, or unless did somebody have a question in the room? No. Um, so I think just ask the two questions at once, let people respond, and okay. then we will. Uh, so these are two questions for Rita Sharp. Uh, the first one from Tasha Arnold. Uh, she says, um, would you comment on the benefit of interdisciplinary study? present a case and have each discipline comment on the issues related to their area of expertise, for example, medical historian, philosopher, ethicist, art historian, literary scholar, perhaps a holistic understanding can be created. So the question is about the benefits of interest. Mm -hmm. And then there's another question. Um, you mentioned uh, spa medicine and Chinese medicine. 
and interactivity in Ayurveda. Yes. Mm -hmm. That also have a mainstream. Mm -hmm. the mainstream medicine is demonized, and an alternative medicine is romanticized. What's your take on this? Yes. Yes. So thank you, Charlie. It's it's yeah. great to hear you. Um, uh, I thought you were going in the other direction. And it turns out that my division of narrative medicine is also in charge of the interprofessional education on the medical campus. So we're the ones who get the, the students of medicine, nursing, dentistry, chaplaincy, genetic counseling, social work, nutrition, occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy, all of them together. And Charlie, when we when we present cases or when when they are together on the wards, um, it's the perspective of each of those professions, each of those disciplines that is necessary for them to, to hear. So it's not so much what does the historian say and what does the philosopher say, but rather we want to teach them the humanities capacities to hear one another across boundaries and barriers and up the status hierarchy so that the doctor doesn't get always the one for the last word. And I can say that because I'm one and I know that we're most responsible. But your other, your other uh, uh, scenario is, is gorgeous also. And, and for the second, I mean, I just mentioned spa medicine and, and traditional Chinese medicine because they came up yesterday at the, at the conference. But indeed it is, and this is, this is back to Rosemary, that, that there's, no, there's no corner on questions of healing and illness for this splinter group, which is Western mainstream medicine. We're, we're a splinter group, and and we have to remember that. I, this is okay. This has been wonderful. Um, we will regroup at um, six forty-five, I think, to give everybody uh, time for dinner. And um, I know that there's nobody in the room afterwards, so <laughs> if those of you will uh, uh, bear with us, uh, we'll probably continue on till about eight fifteen. Um, and uh, yeah, let's thank our okay. Our oh, good. thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, thank you so much to those of you who are joining us from Europe and we try to leave. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you for See joining you us soon. at Bye. midnight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.
Okay. Um, see if I can move this. There we go. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, we're delighted to have you join us for our um, sort of penultimate final pa formal panel, after which we'll have open up the discussion. Um, this panel is on environment and risk. Um, and it features um, two scholars. The first is Chris Parsons, who is an interdisciplinary historian of science, medicine, and the environment in the early modern Atlantic world. His current research traces the devastating spread of smallpox and other European illnesses in the Northeast, New France, New England, New Netherlands in the 1630s in order to understand how epidemic disease shaped colonial encounters and imperial rivalries. He is the author of A Not-So-New World, Empire and Environment in French Colonial North America, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2018. In this and related projects, he has a long-standing interest in highlighting the contribution of indigenous peoples to the evolution of European and Euro-American environmental sciences. He's published articles in the William and Mary Quarterly, Environmental History, Early American Studies, and in several edited collections. I will take your notes. I will take your bias. Oh, bias. Because <laughs> I'm afraid I might forget something. And our second speaker for this last panel is Jean-Christian Vinel, who is professor of American history at the University Paris-Cité. He specializes in labor history, political economy, and the history of inequalities. His previous book include The Employee of Political History, that was 2013, and in 2020, you published Capitalism Contested. His current projects include a forthcoming volume on the right and labor in the US since the Gilded Age, and a social history of health inequality in the US from 1930s onwards. Mm -hmm. No, but who's speaking first? Uh, uh, who's speaking first? Someone would like to be on the program first. Is it alphabetical? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's nope. alphabetical. So. Let me, sorry, I did, let me just get the screen share then. I thought the first submission was a second. No problem. Let me see twice. Don't need to hear anything on this. Because they're hearing me on yeah. that, right? That's, okay. Oh, what is it? No, I said I did the wrong one. There it is. So thank you so much. This has been, I don't know, batting cleanup for this group is uh, a big ask. Uh, it's been a really wonderful two days. Um, I'm gonna situate what I'm working on a little bit more than I did in the paper I pre-circulated um, and just explain my work uh, a little bit in the context of this French uh, Anglo comparison and suggest there's a different French Anglo comparison that I've been involved in for quite some time. Um, which is the com different colonial experiences in New France and New England. I am trained as a historian of New France, um, and much of my career since I've moved to the States has been trying to ask questions of the uh, New England, New English archive that would be fairly easily answered in a colony that had a centralized government and one church, um, and leads me to a lot of methodological creativity to try to recreate things like uh, mortality records, for example. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting as I was teaching was this moment in uh, that in Canadian history or in the history of New France that is foundational, these 1630s uh, epidemics that are very well documented both in uh, administrative records and in uh, missionary records that just devastate um, both Algonquian and uh, Iroquoian peoples up and down the St. Lawrence and into the Great Lakes. And this is really in the historiography of 
Canada and New France, a foundational moment that explains much of what happens in the 17th century. And so I came to New England looking to teach this, these epidemics of smallpox. Smallpox arrives in the same decade, and it's just not there. I think because it's not the first epidemic um, yeah. to arrive, it's less interesting. Um, it, the, the, the genie was out of the bottle and there is much more interest in the 1616 to 1619 epidemics um, than the 1630 arrival oh. of smallpox. And so that's what led me first to say this basic question of this thing that I know happened, what did it look like? Mm -hmm. um, I decided to add on the Dutch because why not? Um, but as I started looking into it, um, this is a quote describing this first outbreak of smallpox um, in William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation um, says, this disease, this is writing in 1634 about 1633. <clears throat> this disease also swept away many of the Indians from all the places near adjoining in the spring before, especially all the month of May. There was such a quantity of a great sort of flies um, like, like bees to wasps or bumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground and replenished all the woods mm -hmm. and eat the green things and made such a constant yelling noise as made all the woods ring of them and ready to deaf the hearers, deafen the hearers. They have not yet by the English been heard or seen before or since, but the Indians told that the sickness, that, that the mm -hmm. sickness would follow them. And so it did in June, July, August, and the um, chief heat of summer. So this is actually likely the first description of the cycle of cicadas. Um, and in this case, we know that cicadas have come on 18 year cycles, and it was 18 years before that there were these epidemics that arrived um, in this part of the world. And so this led me down this path of trying to think about these diseases in a more ecological context. And that also made sense in this comparative Northeast project, where if you think with the remove removing the borders between these colonies, the Northeast is actually kind of an ecological region. And so that's the framing of where I am now. Um, so I wanted to think about these epidemics as ecological events. Um, and I will say that if COVID made us all armchair epidemiologists, for a brief moment, it also made us wildlife ecologists. Yes. Oh, how do I now advance? There we go. Yes. Um, as an American public juggled with new terms such as are not became acquainted with the intricacies of airborne transition and struggled to find toilet paper, influential publications such as the National Geographic, New York Times and Wired, this is a, a clip from uh, a page from um, that time from the New York Times, um, they introduced their readers to animal reservoirs, wildlife markets and the effect of human pressure on wild animal populations the world over. Although the ecological dimensions of coronavirus have largely receded as the focus instead has shifted to questions of the virus's putative origins um, in a Wuhan la lab or the politics of vaccine resistance, humanists have seized the moment nonetheless to amplify existing calls for what we might consider a more ecologically attuned health humanities. These mm -hmm. echo larger calls to quote, entangle the medical or health humanities. Um, there's lots of those. But the environmental humanities have offered particularly fertile ground for cross-pollination. Can't help with the environmental puns. Um, <laughs> as the authors of the recent Bloomsbury Handbook to the Medical Environmental Humanities um, have suggested, these conversations have emerged from a growing sense of, quote, the shared precarity of human and non-human life on Earth. In this, they echoed health practitioners such as those involved with the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change that has argued, among other things, that, quote, climate change is the greatest global health threat facing the world in the 21st century, but is also the greatest opportunity to define the social and environmental determinants of health. Humanists working in the health, uh, in the environmental and health humanities were quick to appreciate the impact that the pandemic had on their lives and their work in a year of special issues and essays devoted to the analysis of the emerging pandemic from humanistic perspectives, calls to understand the imbricated nature of environmental and medical challenges were pronounced. As the editors of, a, of the journal Environmental Humanities explained in November of 2020, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic reminds us that earthly independence is no fairy tale. 
the call for an appreciation of how the environmental and health humanities might work best together to lend the benefit of our skills has grown sharper still. Our very own uh, Karen Thornberg, for example, explained recently that explicit collaborations between the health and environmental humanities have remained relatively rare, but offer great promise as, quote, advocacy, care, and ultimately global healing of both non-human or human beings and non-human beings uh, remain among our greatest challenges. These are, of course, welcome arrivals, but they evoke to my mind ongoing challenges seemingly intrinsic to the health humanities. How many hyphens can there actually be? Right. Right. Um, I don't wanna, this is a fantastic book, but this is medical environmental humanities, doesn't roll off the tongue. And I'm sure a lot of us around this table could critique every one of those terms yeah. to death. So. Right. Here, then, I will suggest that bringing the environmental and health humanities is to risk another hyphen or two, um, another claim on the need for what Kirsten Oster has called a digital health humanities. Mm -hmm. It's turtles all the way down. Um, <laughs> indeed, as we have seen these past years, the contributions of digital health humanists, such as, as Oster and similar projects by colleagues in critical data studies, have revealed the benefits of humanistic perspectives on data heavy fields where quantitative analysis is the norm. COVID amplified a growing trend that saw the environmental humanities become more focused on health and the health humanities begin to more, think more fully about the ecological dimensions of their fields. I have examples here. I won't necessarily go into great detail, um, although I did actually, it'll be interesting as we go into France to hear more about the environmental history in the States really announces uh, kind of a direct descent from the Annals School in France. Um, and yet the environmental history in France seems to not be as cool with that lineage. Um, but anyways, there is this transatlantic conversation um, that predates this. I think sometimes in the work I'm doing, I come to some conclusion and I only realize that I've basically rediscovered a paper that was written in 1967 using quantitative methods to reconstruct demography yeah. um, or climate change. Yet for me, the attraction of a more ecologically attentive human health humanities is the opening up of new terrains to uncover the slow violence of structural racism, colonialism, and capitalism. It is in precisely these domains where the experiences of marginalized peoples, the peoples that the slow violence is uh, affected upon, that are, their experiences are most difficult to obtain. In my own field, for example, decades of scholarship has sought to adequately explain the effect of introduced epidemic disease within and among indigenous peoples of the Americas. And yet the horizon of the textual archives is most often limited to the, the pale of settlement along the coast with little sense of what happened in a broader hemispheric sense, let alone hundred miles from the shore. 50 miles. Um, so it's within these contexts that humanists have often been, okay. Yeah. It's within these contexts that humanists have often been sidelined from efforts to understand these depopulating epidemics as ecological events. It's certainly not to suggest that historians and literary scholars have not painstakingly combed through and put to work colonial era archives. Um, to understand the social, cultural, and even ecological effects of these illnesses. But uh, by and large, colleagues who have directed this conversation, a number who are at the, are, are at the institution we're at right now, have directed, uh, have shifted the focus of histories of these epidemics towards their human dimensions. These are histories of social and cultural reproduction, challenged geopolitical relationships, disrupted, or the analyses of Aboriginal deaths um, that decenter microbes themselves. There's an edited collection that came out a number of years ago called Beyond Germs. Um, the argument here is we have to look past a biological determinism to understand the full colonial context right. for why so many people died the way they did. And this is literary scholar, been work done by literary scholars and historians who've worked in everywhere from South America, Peru, all the way up to the New France that I've studied. Um, and there's been particularly important work uh, close to right where we are now, where scholars such as Cristobal Silva or Joyce Chaplin have demonstrated the cultural work that indigenous deaths did for colonial cultures. 
um, supporting providential justifications of Anglo-American colonialism and violence. But this work, as important and as generative as it has been, has had little evident impact on recent efforts to understand these epidemics as ecological events. And it's largely because of the perception about the archives with which we work, it seems. We can look, for example, to a relatively recent and, fair and widely covered study that sought the origins of the Anthropocene, this moment where you can see mm -hmm. a real human footprint um, on the climate. Fingerprint, sorry, eh, footprint, fingerprint. Um, yeah, <clears throat> um, called uh, Earth Systems Impacts of the o European Arrival and Great Dying in the Americas after 1492. Um, I'm going to pick on this one a little bit because it's fairly recent um, and it was covered widely in a lot of kind of popular science and actually just popular journalism. Um, but this is one of a broad type of work, primarily done by um, environmental scientists, geographers, geologists. Um, who have tried to understand this radical environmental transformation in the 16th and 17th century um, and look at the place of disease in this. They are really trying to do, I think, important enviromedical studies. Mm. Um, these authors and our colleagues in anthropology, geography, and earth sciences departments with whom we might make common cause turn to the limited quantitative evidence and mathematical models to move beyond the limitations particularly geographical and temporal of our text-based archive with which we're most confident. Uh, Koch et al, um, of the authors of this paper, repeatedly tout the unreliability of textual evidence, preferring instead the data gathered from climate proxies and interpreted from archeological sites. And their reliance on large scale, scale modeling seems according to them to lead to a possible co conflict with the humanists who they see in the abstract um, they might be familiar with the, with the humanists I've talked about, but they don't cite any of them. Um, and their model of why people died the way they did is astonishingly simple. They wrote, they write, for example, quote, while other factors such as warfare, the enslavement of indigenous people and hunger following social disintegration resulting from the loss of such a large fraction of societies meant even larger population losses, we focus on the epidemics as the main driver behind the majority of the deaths in the great dying. There's this phrase, mm -hmm. great dying, that I have a great deal with. And they say, we know this is complicated, but for the purposes of our model, it's not. Oh, dear. Um, as such, these projects have little to add to humanistic conversations about colonial power relations, violence, displacement, that have been the focus of recent studies of this era. Their mm -hmm. impact lies elsewhere. They have had um, an outsized public impact. For example, oh, they cut, cut off. Um, the bottom right is CNN, the top right is The Guardian, and the left is the BBC. This is all popular coverage of that article in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about this massive uh, death and the impact it had. There's some sense that this was a bad thing that Europeans caused, but the Native Americans appear really in the abstract. Mm -hmm. um, so we're nonetheless able to see, we are nonetheless able to see where humanists have been able to join these conversations elsewhere um, and to what effect. Historians have by and large been of interest to scholars focused on more specific times and places than they appear in papers um, and are used to show in place of just death, life and resilience. As the editors of a special issue of Geo Humanities um, on the health humanities argued, for example, the challenge to these collaborations can reveal that the challenge was to reveal the no, that didn't write right. Anyways, the challenge is how to reveal quote um, how diverse geography shape and thread through health and medical processes. So there's this emphasis less on these monolithic explanations, these simplistic models, um, uh, a more complex picture. My colleagues such as Robert Morrissey, a historian of French Illinois, or Dan Richter, an early Americanist who studied the Haudenosaunee, um, have contributed substantially um, to fleshing out indigenous responses to introduced epidemic disease. And they've been cited heavily by anthropologists who've sought to understand societal and cultural responses to climate change and epidemic disease. Um, Harvard's own David Jones, who can't be here tonight. Um, his work on depopulating epidemics in the 16th and 17th century um, is particularly well cited as it contributes to an interdisciplinary study of depopulation and land use histories in the American Southeast, 
that emphasizes, quote, the timing and severity of depopulation events and how they varied across the continent. And actually, totally um, accidentally, I was listening to, I don't know how many of you know Amitav Ghosh, um, yeah. but I'm reading his, I'm listening to his uh, Nutmeg's Curse. Um, and as I was walking over to here, I was listening on an audiobook. And it was quite a quite lovely working through David Jones um, and another historian, Paul Kelton, to this effect, to say there's more to this story than disease. Yeah. So moving beyond citation and envisioning instead possible collaborations, it's clear that humanity scholars will have to both regain comfort with quantitative evidence that generations of social historians on both sides of the Atlantic used to use more regularly and seek insights from newer fields such as critical data studies. Um, this is precisely then where what Kirsten Oster has called the digital, digital health humanities um, can provide a path forward. As Oster has defined the approach, she says, quote, the skill, these are skills that contribute to the field of digital humanities that draw from a wide range of other fields, including critical code studies and media theory, computer programming and biomedical informatics, science and technology studies, health policy, um, human computer interaction, user design experience um, and health promotion and, or health promotion and behavioral science as well as historical and ethical reasoning. In the context of COVID, this has meant studies of practices of gathering, analyzing and representing data in a way that in such a way as to highlight marginalizations or absence, implicit narratives or biases and analyses and the visual rhetoric of representation such as the John Hopkins global COVID dashboard. Critical data studies scholars such as Lauren Klein um, brought their toolkit to COVID arguing that the pandemic, and I would say all of these diseases, these outbreaks in the past, um, offer a stark opportunity to see how systems of power operate with and through seemingly innocuous or innocent data. Already we can see how this might work as climate historians have kind of blazed a trail here and modeled an effective engagement with proxy data from sources such, sources such as tree rings and ice cores and an ability to speak to the methods and concerns of geologists and environmental scientists. Historian, Georgetown historian Dagmar de Groot, for example, um, has both written extensively about early modern Atlantic climates and been part of larger col collaborations such as that which produced this essay on the left towards the rigorous understanding of societal responses to climate change, which appeared in Nature in 2021. Um, and this training is particularly evident in the group was one of the most, most, most cogent and engagements with this uh, Koch et al study. And he was able because of his skills to actually critique the models um, that were used and kind of pull them apart. In this, he's joined by his colleagues, such as historical epi epi epidemiologist, Timothy Neufeld, who is third author on this paper on the right, um, who argues humanists can help turn our focus towards quote, micro region cases, um, such as the colonial Latin America that Cocodal are primarily interested in with a more sophisticated use of colonial era, era documents integrated with quantitative, quantitative paleoclimate data. And again, I'm not saying we all have to publish in these places, but a bunch, this is a bunch of historians on the right are pub, getting published in PNAS, um, mm -hmm. making the case um, for collaborations as opposed to just uh, complaining. Um, the effect is to more fully locate our analyses. This, they might be um, result in smaller geographic and temporal breaths, but they localize work in real communities and fully address questions about the resilience of indigenous communities. As I say, they turn our conversation to from abstract considerations of death to the challenges of life in the colonial era. So if we risk adding one more hyphen um, or blowing up our big tent entirely, uh, it remains imperative for the health and environmental humanities to collaborate on analyses of the twin crises that face us all today, climate change and uh, the pandemic. As I've argued here, this will mean, however, moving beyond the archives most traditionally associated with the health humanities, collaborating in the analyses and critique of big data, both past and present. If the environmental and health humanities need each other, they also need the digital health humanities. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Sari and, and Sophie for organizing this great workshop and bring us, bringing us all here. Um, 
Today, I'd like to start my, my remarks by going back to an article on health inequality published in the Financial Times about a month ago uh, on March 31st, entitled Why Americans Die So Young. It offered a sustained statistical analysis of the important gap that now exists between the US and the UK when it comes to life expectancy. At every point in the income distribution, the article contended Americans can now expect to live shorter lives than the British. And the gap is even wider if one takes into account the expectancy of a healthy life. But what makes the trend more arresting is that it mostly affects younger Americans. And it's much more obvious in areas that are heavily white working class, according to the article. Um, the US, in fact, uh, um, the article suggested, uh, stands apart in the Western world because life expectancy would have declined in the last few years, even without uh, uh, COVID deaths. Now, let me take you back just a day earlier. On Wednesday, uh, uh, March 30th, former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz testified in front of the Senate's Education and Labor Committee. In a much anticipated hearing, Schultz was confronted by the committee's chairman, Bernie Sanders, over the labor law violations for which Starbucks has been sued on some 200 different counts by employees seeking to form a union. Sanders indeed accused the company of conducting an intense anti-union campaign. Schultz, by contrast, insisted that the firm had never broken the law although it certainly had a preference when it came to collective bargaining. What struck me as I thought about these two separate events is precisely that, how separate, disconnected they seem to be in public discussions. On the one hand, one finds a pressing issue of public health that's been prominent in the news in the last few years, prominent not simply because Americans tend to die young, but also because socioeconomic inequalities in health have significantly increased uh, in the US, even as the racial gap, in fact, uh, uh, somewhat narrowed. Um, the increase has been such that life um, expectancy has stagnated and, in, uh, and even in fact uh, receded for some socio-demographic group in the US. On the other hand, the tug of war uh, uh, between Sanders and Schultz took place against a backdrop of renewed tensions over wages, working conditions, and workplace democracy, and also, more generally, renewed democratic su party support for collective bargaining. There are obvious links between these two discussions, most obviously the fact that uh, American companies are loath to deal with unions, uh, because they see them as meddlesome institutions, but also because healthcare is a significant factor in the collective uh, bargaining equation. Moreover, in both debates, you find elements of uh, inequality over class and racial lines, um, socioeconomic inequalities in health, and current labor strife are tied to the rise of income inequality in the US since the uh, um, 1980s and yet those links are rarely addressed. Today, I'd like to reflect on the historical dynamics of this separation between health inequality and labor rights, or at least take a first step towards trying to write a history of it. Tracing a history that goes back to the progressive era, I argue that scholarship and policymaking in the field of uh, health inequality and labor history have followed distinct lines and roads, adopted different methodologies, so much so that they've been somewhat impervious to cross fertilization. Can you read that last sentence? I'm sorry? Can you read the last sentence? Yeah, they followed distinct lines and roads, adopted different methodologies, so much so that they have been somewhat impervious to cross fertilization. Now, I look at this disjuncture from the standpoint of a labor historian, uh, uh, of course. Um, let me take you back briefly to the early 20th, 20th century, when public discussions and political debates were largely dominated by what people called the labor question at the time. Um, reformers who watched the industrial landscape during the progressive era found two great contradictions. The first was political, the fact that workers were expected to check their citizenship rights at the door of yeah. the factory, you know, and, and basically submit to the arbitrary rule of, um, of managers. Reformers thought that this led to social strife, violence, and they championed industrial democracy, the notion that 
companies should be run according to rules crafted by representatives of workers and managers. The second contradiction that they looked at had to do with health and mortality. Mm -hmm. um, in spite of the significant technological and scientific progress that was being made at the time, health inequality loomed extremely large in the minds of these reformers. They Florence Kelly, for example, a translator of Engels, a prominent advocate of minimum wage laws, and a champion of the protection of women at work, who made this point in modern industry. I quote, with the help of modern hygiene, preventive medicine, enriched by all the new resources, we ought to be living on our 70th birthdays. Yet, at present, the average age at the death of most Americans in the US is 47 years. And although statistical research on health at the time was still in its infancy and they lamented that, it already offered striking evidence of the disproportionate incidence of ill health among industrial workers. This was revealed, for example, by, uh, uh, in a book co-authored by Jetlock, a prominent labor economist at the time, and Edgar Seden Stricker, who was the nation's uh, premier uh, public health uh, um, expert uh, in the progressive era, and, uh, and they showed that workers in agriculture during the progressive era were three times likelier uh, to reach the age of 70 than industrial workers. Workers were at a much higher risk of dying from preventable diseases such as T fluid, tuberculosis, alcohol, suicide, or degenerative diseases like cancer, kidney failures, for example. And like other reformers who conducted research for the Children's Bureau, for example, uh, these reformers found a strong correlation between the workers' uh, uh, family income uh, and health outcomes. Um, so in many ways, what these reformers did was walking into the footsteps of W.E.B. Du Bois, who argued even earlier uh, um, against the idea that the gap in health between Black Americans and white Americans had biological origins. Um, but they went further in suggesting that disparities in health and, and mortality were the byproducts of industrial organization, the industrial environment, and that these disparities could not be remedied without fundamental changes in the political organization of uh, companies. What John Fitch in the Pittsburgh survey called the system of exploitation that left workers without vital um, energy. In other words, what I try to say in this paper first is that to labor reformers, uh, a workplace democracy and health inequality were two sides of the same coin. Uh, yet, uh, um, in the course of the 1930s and 1940s, this symbiotic link was broken. This can seem paradoxical. Uh, it was in the context of the Great Depression, of course, as poverty struck a large part of the population, that reformers made headway in their efforts to develop a politics of security for uh, um, Americans. Uh, reformers like Seden Stricker uh, were involved in the adoption of the 1935 Social Security Act. He was also involved in the first National Health Survey, which was conducted in 1935 and 36. And of course, it was at the very same time that major labor reform uh, was effected by uh, the New Dealers. And yet, the two efforts you know, remedying health inequalities and protecting the rights of workers who are no longer linked. The old cry of industrial democracy still resonated powerfully, of course, in the context of the labor struggles of the 1930s. But liberals increasingly frame labor reform as a proto-Keynesian measure made necessary to shore up demand, avoid underconsumption. In other words, during the 1930s, Purchasing power, the ability to take part in a consumer uh, uh, society took center stage in public discussions over class distinctions, while health inequality and mortality took a back seat. Mm -hmm. This became very visible as the heirs of progressive liberal reformers came to power in the 1940s and 1950s at the head of important labor agencies. The heirs of Jetlock and John R. Commons, for example, established the parameters of, post -war, of the post-war labor order, uh, but in doing so, they narrowed the field of labor economics, presenting arbitration and labor law adjudication 
as a type of technical expertise that could be deployed uh, to solve specific labor disputes taking place within companies. Although unions, in fact, in the US, were tasked with uh, uh, the mission of negotiating healthcare uh, uh, policies for their workers, the questions of health were basically left aside of labor economics. And most importantly, those labor economics celebrated the disappearance of class conflict on the American scene. This evolution was compounded in the field of health inequality, as um, Nancy Krager, a Harvard scholar, uh, scholar here, uh, uh, and Elizabeth Thee uh, showed uh, a while ago. Efforts to institutionalize research on um, social class and mortality, efforts that had developed since the beginning of the progressive era, gradually foundered in the 1940s. This was because there was, you know, the, the memory of the depression was somewhat receding because Congress was much more conservative. And then the Cold War delegitimized any type of social science research on class in, in the United States. This does not mean that there are no public records or studies pertaining to socioeconomic inequality in health produced in the 1950s, but these seem to have been ad hoc efforts that remained a very far cry from the kind of official statistics produced in Europe. And did in the US, from the late 1940s onwards, vital statistics were routinely stratified by race, age, and sex, but social class was totally left out. And those statistics reveal significant gaps between white and black Americans, very, very impressive gaps, but social classes are just basically left out. Oh. Um, so to make a longer story uh, a, a bit shorter, uh, what I argue in the paper is that only in the 1970s did liberal reformers once more seek to connect class and health. And this was uh, at the time when the Department of Health, Education and Welfare commissioned a report uh, uh, entitled Work in America. Mm -hmm. And the, the report was really commissioned uh, uh, in the context of the debate of their what was called at the time the blue color blues, the discontent of the white working class that could be observed in society and politics. And what's interesting about this report, which is not mentioned so often, is that it did talk a lot about the health of workers, but it talked about mental health oh. <laughs> mostly. It suggested that by enriching work, one might offer a solution to the anxiety and frustration of these uh, uh, workers and their Anxiety could be seen in a rising trend of suicides, alcoholism, drug abuse. In fact, very, very early signs of what today is called, you know, deaths of despair. Yeah. But questions of class, health, and longevity were basically barely touched upon. Mm -hmm. The logic was still one of progress. You know, mm -hmm. having fulfilled the workers' material needs, American society now needed to fulfill their psychological needs by moving away from the worst features of Taylorism and assembly line uh, work. And what's very interesting is this was the moment when social epidemiology really changed in America when scholars in that field um, started reinvesting the field of uh, uh, social class and socioeconomic inequalities by using income and education as proxies for social class. And what's to me even more interesting is the context, uh, the political context, uh, as conservative governments in the UK and, and the US, and this was really a transnational dialogue in the field of epidemiology, as the, you know, those governments promoted supply side theories to foster economic growth. Research in epidemiology increasingly revealed the adverse effects of underinvestment in health. Uh, uh, programs in the context of growing income inequality, while also suggesting that maybe the effects of social policies, even in countries like Britain, on social gaps in longevity had been more limited than what had been previously um, expected. And since then, research in, in the field of social epidemiology in the US has largely pointed to the continuous increase of those uh, uh, social gaps. 
And what strikes me is that at the very same time as social epidemiologist Rain Bastille, the field, uh, uh, the question of social inequality, well, labor historians were moving in an entirely uh, direction. What was called the new labor history that developed in the 1970s and 1980s in America is very much a cultural history. Very, uh, very much uh, uh, influenced by the work of British scholars like E.P. Thompson. And so it's a history from the bottom up, um, a history that seeks to understand the making of class consciousness as a cultural and social uh, process. So it, it, it certainly puts race, class, gender, and, and very, and more lately, intersectionality front and center, but it's by words or not gaps in longevity, their experience agency. And the result of this is, has been a move away from class as a social structure. Very much what social epidemiologists are describing is what you will not find in, in, in books, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, written by uh, labor historians, you know, as great as uh, they are. I'll just give you two examples to to finish this talk, uh, one of my favorite books ever, a book by a Harvard historian, Elizabeth Cohen, it's called Making a New Deal. And it's about workers in Chicago in the 1920s and 30s. It's an incredible book. And she shows how workers basically sort of developed an American identity in a constant dialogue with, with the New Deal and, and how social policies instituted during the 1930s basically really made them feel American and changed their vision of, a, of American citizenship. And so how they went from an ethnic consciousness yeah. to yeah. a consciousness as Democrats and, uh, 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 and really Americans. And what's very, very fascinating about the book is her discussion of social class. Uh, and again, it's a great book, never, actually approaches questions of health, even during the Great Depression. Um, another book that I think is a, is a wonder, Michael Honey's book on the Memphis sanitation uh, uh, strike in 1968. Um, he shows the effects of segregation and harsh working and living conditions, how these conditions shaped the lives of Black sanitation workers and drew Martin Luther King to that to that struggle and mentions in passing, really in passing that they suffer disproportionately from sickle cell, anemia, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer. But the, the book never actually tries to connect uh, the two. Inequality is presented as mostly a, a political problem, uh, uh, really. Uh, and of course it, it is. So as a, a conclusion to, to what is really an exploratory note, I'd like to suggest that labor historians could play a role in the field of medical humanities by taking up the challenge that the impressive body of social epidemiology represents for them. One of the main takeaways of recent studies in social epidemiology, as I can tell, is the, the focus on the local environment. Yeah. Uh, uh, and how that local environment plays an important role, uh, a central role in the ways social determinants of uh, uh, social determinants sorry, affect health outcomes. So if labor historians reconnected with the ecological perspective pioneered by the first generation of labor reformers and scholars during the progressive era, they could produce maybe detailed local studies offering a much needed complement on the causal pathways of health inequalities. Mm -hmm. Focusing, of course, both on racial and, 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 and social dynamics. And in doing so, they could really put to the test the notion that democracy at work and socioeconomic inequalities in health are interrelated uh, issues. Thank you. Wow. Can I just say, leave it to the historians to come in at the end and say, we all need to go read work done in the 50s and 60s again. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like it's like all these literary scholars, and then we come in as the cranks at the end <laughs> and just say, we lost our way. We need to we, we, we need to rediscover like 50s, 60 social history. So we were thinking that we might just kind of merge the last two. So uh just give a question to the two of you, and then if it more if it sort of moves out to broader questions about um 
the uh, about the symposium. That's great. Um, but we understand that everybody is also probably very tired. So, uh, so this seems like the most organic way to proceed. Um, questions? Oh, yeah, uh, I think we have uh, I'm, I'm just so grateful that you all the time and attention to think about us. Oh well, there's. <laughs> thank you. You, I, you learn. I mean, it's you learn. Uh, reading social epidemiology, it's it's so fasc it's Americans. fascinating. <laughs> oh, oh, Americans. Uh, yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question about building this up, because one of the things that is happening in the nineteen fifties is that at the same time you're describing the separation. I'm just wondering how much um, the fact that yes, there are race stati racial statistics and not class statistics in them, and how much that depends upon a kind of 1950s racism mm. in which, just bear with me a moment, in which it's okay to say how many Blacks are not making it because that is to some degree you know, accepted vulnerable life. And the, the way that I'm playing this is internationally because it's exactly in the 1950s when the Carnegie Corporation gets all interested in social nets, the creation of social nets in South Africa. And what does it do? It sends a review board to check out social nets in South Africa. There's like a 600, 800,000 page report that is public, in, I mean, you know, in history. Um, but it's concerned about poor whites. Um, it's only on poor whites. Um, and so, oh, sorry. So, so I just wanted to raise that. And then the second thing I wanted to raise is, um, cause I think there's something going on there that is quite interesting for your, for your work. But the second thing I just wanted to raise is, um, fifth wave public health theory, which really plays into your argument. And that would be, um, Hanlon et al, who argue that we've had extremely big waves of public health theory in the past that made huge gains. And of course, they would begin uh, in a kind of Eurocentric way with the with the pump and in London. And then they would they name a number of others. Like I think the fourth wave might be um, mother to uh, mother child PMT, uh, not PMT, you can tell I work in AIDS, mother child health care. Um, but they say that the fifth wave is impossible that there will be any fifth wave that will make a big global intervention such as mother-child healthcare, because the way that we live, that is colonial capitalism, is itself the disease. And that the, the and 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 that the 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 secondary effects it throws up are the symptoms. Yes. So that when we go to questions that would touch on our first paper around you know, contemporary ways of living amongst Aboriginal communities, one can start to imagine, for example, with the low um, work uh, ability to work in rural South Africa for Black males and the um, impossible working and living conditions of Aboriginal peoples in various parts of Canada, that drug addiction is a way of creating an enjoyable slow death as opposed to the slow death of colonial capitalism, if that makes any sense. Just to offer that. Um, it, it, it's very clear. Uh, the question of 1950s racism, um, yes, it's, that's the hard question. Um, quite obviously, a lot of Americans are more comfortable with the idea that there are racial gaps in health than, yes. than social gaps at the yes. time. There was also really the belief in the 1950s, a lot of historians have written about that, that the the working class has really become a, a middle class that is contented, uh, uh, really, in in, uh, in many ways. Now, uh, so that would be the short answer. Uh, it's easier to talk about. But then, when you look at the, you know, when you look at the public health reports that uh, you know tuberculosis in the nineteen fifties, what you find is that, I mean, tuberculosis declines for black and white Americans. You know, the, the I mean, the difference remains very significant. But the reports will tell you that there's progress from both, uh, you know, uh, 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 parts of the American population. Um, it, it's presented in a very, you know, neutral way. But certainly, a lot of people also thought, well, 
you know, progress is good. And uh, during the Cold War, in fact, American racism was a problem for, <laughs> for the American government. It was used by the USSR, you know, against uh, uh, the United States. Uh, um, uh, and so I, it's hard to, it's hard to say that only American racism or the racism embedded in American society really explains, you know, what happened mm -hmm. to the evolution of, of um, social epidemiology in the 19, uh, in the 1950s. Um, Sorry, I wasn't suggesting it as an mm, only fact, I was just suggesting more an intersectoral. It, 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 it matters, yeah. um, the, the definitely. Uh, but again, um, for a number of uh, uh, of liberals, uh, racism in America is is a disease. It, it, it needs to be it needs to be cured. Um, but the liberal gesture of accommodation would be in the argument. In what way? In the way that um, the statistics are based on the idea of equality in the language of those fifties reports. Mm -hmm. of a, a basic human equality in the reportage of the statistic. So mm -hmm. what matters is more that we're all human, not that there are mm -hmm. differences between black and white. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd be yeah. asking. Okay. If that makes sense. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I, um, I'm aware that all the questions are not going to this at the moment. Okay. But I was also um, curious if um, thinking about the relationship between labor and how in the 20th century, you had talked about the increasing importance of private health insurance because mm -hmm. that, I don't think you mentioned that, and it's very probably something that kind of grows in the East, right? I may be. No, it doesn't work. Yeah. I, sorry, it's the, 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 it's I, if I, I, I did, I'm not an historian, and just in a, in a very impressionistic way, I think I remember when I was younger um, that the, one of the things that kind of broke a number of things, uh, a number of factors in American healthcare and the unions was when the auto workers had to start paying for part of their health insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, I think, um, you know, was was part of a real crisis in the unions, a real crisis in the American uh, auto industry, because so much of the money that went into making the cars uh, went to healthcare instead of making good cars. Um, and then all of a sudden, we have a situation like we have now, where um, employers are no longer covering the vast majority of the, or it's a great privilege if you do, uh, uh, if, if you have an employer who can cover the vast majority of your health insurance. Um, and now uh, the unions, the, the privilege of being in the union drops because you don't have that and you're paying anyway. Um, and I think that that really shook things up. So I, I, um, I wonder if that's part of the story that you found yes. or whether you could say yes. something about it now. Mm. Yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's very important. And uh, in fact, there are two things. Um, in the US, unions play a role that is played by welfare states in, in Europe. And as I said, including negotiating healthcare uh, uh, provisions in collective bargaining agreements. This was at the insistence, in fact, of um, employers who would rather sign with private insurance companies and have, you know, European style welfare policies. So the question, uh, but you have to remember um, 
even at the peak of their influence, un unions did not you know, represent every single worker in the United States. Um, so I'm, I guess the question that I'd like to ask is this, what difference did health insurance with private origins, but what difference did it make in the health of workers between the 1930s and the 1960s? Um, Louis Dublin, for example, who was a, a statistician for Metropolitan Life Insurance, and, and that's a company that had a number of uh, uh, contracts with labor unions. At the end of the 1940s said that there was a significant rise in the life expectancy of the policyholders, industrial policyholders of uh, metropolitan uh, uh, life insurance. So they were beyond uh, uh, average earlier in the century and they were above average, he said, at the end of the 1940s. So I'd like to learn more about that, how basically that semi-private system influenced the, the health of workers. What about their uh, wives? What about their children? Um, no one has looked at these statistics. Uh, what about the people who are not covered by these types of insurance? Um, and then uh, uh, to finish answering your question, what happened to these workers uh, in times of deindustrialization and, and beyond? And, and, and that's a different era, of course, uh, um, but you're right. Uh, um, they found themselves in, in the, very much in dire straits uh, uh, in financial and in health terms, yes. There, just tag on to that. Sorry, there, in the, there, it did have a cost too. In the, in I feel like the Canadian who says everything is like well in Canada, um, but like the, part of the long, the story of the longevity of the auto industry in Canada is one lower dollar, but two uh, public health insurance mm -hmm. that lowered significantly um, the cost of employment, um, and so there is like it, the, the in terms of thinking of like the the long-term cost of private insurance and it like the health effects and yeah. that sort of stuff, there was like, that's part of what it's, kept GM and stuff like that opened up and mm. kept GM in Canada for as long as it was. But if you look at every Western country, you see those automakers basically declining one or another, you know, I mean, although in Paris, you know, those factories are gone too. Um, so, um, <laughs> Again, the cost, uh, uh, the wages of auto workers in the 1960s are very high, you know, and we have lots of books that show that, you know, uh, the steel workers, they could take a day off of United Nations Day that was part of their collective bargaining agreement in the United States. Um, but again, the question is, what did it mean to be a worker when you were sick? Yeah. Even, you know, even before the industrialization. And that's, that's what I'm trying to, 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 to figure out really. Um... Can I just mm -hmm. say, can I just offer you a citation? Um, I don't know. Um, perhaps you have encountered this book, but I, it, it is a book that tries to answer some of the questions mm -hmm. that you're talking about here. Um, it's Gabriel Winant. Um, yeah, in the next shift. In the next shift, yeah. yeah. And but, the, yeah, well, it's not it's not it's not a book about that. It's it's, it's a book about the um, Pittsburgh uh, and how and the shift from the white working class in Pittsburgh to a new working class that is uh, very much anchored in the healthcare sector and, and and also higher ed and which is also much more interracial and how basically the health policies negotiated by. Uh, those unions during the uh, uh, during the industrial era led to healthcare being a business in in, in Pittsburgh, and that business now employs a new a whole new working class. And yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, but yeah. I think like part of this argument is that what happened to in the moment of the industrialization was exactly that these same people, the wives of the of the auto workers mm. and the steel workers, got jobs in hospitals. Right, and that's how they mm. made ends meet. Mm. So, like the one directly mm. led into the other. Mm. Yeah. And he also says that there are uh, more problems of race in uh, in Pittsburgh, for example, during the nineteen seventies rise. May I ask? May I ask the first two? Yes. 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 Oh yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that's right. I'll come around. Okay. Okay. 
I was just wanting to ask a question about your call for um, uh, data on the, um, I'm just trying to go back to my, my uh, notes, but you were calling for um, an interdisciplinary response on um, uh, big data health humanities, right? And I would agree with that up to a point, but as somebody who has done, you know, randomized controlled trials using large big quant data, I just want to say torture the data and it will confess. That is to say that there's nothing particularly sacred about, I mean, I certainly agree that we need quantitative methodologies interdisciplinary working with um, the histories that you're talking about. But to go in history with quant, quant data, which is what I think that you're suggesting, or are you suggesting something more than that, is, a, a, you know, accords a kind of positivity to the reclamation of certain kinds of data, which I don't think are in the historical record and may in fact obscure the fact that what we really need to go back is what you started with, which is, you know, here are these folks who know that exactly 17 years or whatever after the arrival of, you know, um, uh, this particular, uh, 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 to use an old fashioned word, plague, the disease comes. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so I just am a little concerned about the replace, you know, the stopping the holes of certain kinds of interdisciplinary connections with big data. Yeah, I'm not calling yeah. by any stretch of the imagination for us to just embrace data. I think like the the what I would say is working like reading along the grain of data and, mm -hmm. and against it. And I think actually the best cases I've seen, like Timothy Newfeld for, mm -hmm. for a while was at um organized at Princeton these like week-long camps on how to read tree rings and ice mm -hmm. core samples. And you weren't gonna come out of that and get a grant to go get your own ice samples, but mm -hmm. you were going to become like have a tourist level vocabulary where you could collaborate and ask smart questions. I think like the my issue with like the state of the work is they run functionally in parallel. Um, they're the, yeah, and so and so I'm not calling for us to do history um, or do data. I'm just and and in fact the people who are doing critical data studies tend to be like in high schools and literature and this sort of stuff. They're not but they're literate enough um, that they can kind of unblack box the models, the, right. these sorts of things. Would you quantitate a deep investment in the And like, for example, like my, when I read some of these things, like the, the paper that I kind of beat up on, like that, in that case, like, were I asked to be part of that, like, I think that's a sort of unsavable project in itself like the sorts of assumptions it's making and the models it's using I think are just like they ask a question that can't be answered um period like they're asking the wrong questions and going about it with a like a higher degree of certainty they're making assumptions about indigenous populations and reforestation rates that have like no basis in historical yeah, experience okay. so no I, i'm not saying that we need to oh, okay. like Ooh, I fill yeah. gaps with data but so much as like be literate enough that uh, uh, um fluent enough yes, um yes. that we can engage in those collaborations and i think that's what the climate historians have done quite well they're not simply saying you're doing this all wrong or you've done everything wrong up until here we'll take it from now um but they're collaborating in smart ways and offering like real critiques of these methods that speak to the people <laughs> doing them. I get that completely, and I didn't support that. Can I give the back down? Of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so I well, have. To get to the end. Thank you so much for for this last panel, and um, I had several questions, but I'll ask just perhaps two. Um, I had a question slash comment on uh the digital humanities and health humanities and it's also to try and bring in also a comparative perspective but it, it's a it's rather pragmatic but i feel that um there are situations 
uh, of accessibility to archives, accessibility to digitized projects, which are um, very different. And coming from a new, uh, not new, but a new job in a university that really doesn't have the same means as my previous university, um, anything that is, yeah, most of what is not made accessible. So I'm thinking of uh, Gallica, which is not about the archives, but the printed material, right? Uh, is going to be more difficult now for me to have access to. And I was wondering if you had comments about this and how you know to engage in the digital humanities, which are creating, I think, a, a, a very uh, important discrepancy between um, those who have the means and those who don't. So that's my question for you. And my question, well, I had a question, a comment. The question was the role of, if you could uh, compare uh, the role of unions in uh, the negotiation of insurance in the US and the role of union in the negotiation of uh, secondary in insurance, which is mutual in France, and uh, because that also had a very uh, important role, I think, from like uh, and engages the history of labor in uh, the health humanities. So, if you knew some work being done about this and about work, and I'm going to put that in the chat now about work in the health humanities that have been successful in including labor historians. I wanted to mention a work which I love, a project which I love, which I think uh, was finished al already four or five years ago called Silicosis mm -hmm. by uh, Paul-André Rosenthal. And it's uh, just for those who don't know, it's a project that's an in, uh, interdisciplinary project on silicosis. And it's a, a historical research, but that was uh, carried uh, on with um, uh, medical doctors and uh, uh, people in the digital humanities and uh, epidemiologists, et cetera, to map uh, the the reasons for and also environment reasons for uh, silicosis and it's a very interesting project <laughs> which uh, is worth looking at. Um, so I will actually talk about a different project I'm involved in in this context. So I'm, I've been working with some colleagues. Um, again, it actually is one of these projects where I said, like, if I wanted to do this in Montreal, I could do it immediately. I was actually just, it was the anniversary recently of the uh, 1721 to smallpox epidemic in Boston. This is a particularly well studied and well documented. And we said, why don't we look at who died and, and map it? Mm -hmm. um, and this would not be so hard in a place where there was a Catholic church and a central government, as opposed to like, I'm pretty sure the person who was legally required to gather vital statistics, but they didn't really do it for about like 200 years. Um, so the project has actually been trying to reconstruct the vital statistics. We've gotten about you know 400 of about 1,200 deaths we've reconstructed, and our problem has actually been the 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 media of representation and the question of immediacy. Um, and access, because what we have found is something like the first thing we did was put these out in GIS um, and uh, kind of like put little pins, but those weren't right because actually there were no street addresses um, and how everything is relational in Boston. So I know this person died and they lived, they were, their house abutted these people and those people probably lived there. So like a pin doesn't work. Um, and so figuring, and, and then the idea with this was we have a lot of kind of notarial documents too that we can then get into like, well, what happened to their kids? Um, what did they die with? Like, these are the sorts of public historical questions that at least in Boston, um, we thought would be of interest. But the question we had was how to represent A, the uncertainty in the archive, and our interpretations. Because if we just plotted, I keep saying plotting, plotting deaths, and that has a different meaning. Um, someone asked me what I was, when my, my sisters came, they asked what you were doing, and I was like, oh, I was plotting deaths this week. Um, anyways, putting, placing deaths on a map 
Um, and then, but I want, I needed to explain like why these 400 out of 1200, who's not showing up? When I then bring out the, the, the notarial documents that give a sense of where these people live and what, I need to explain, again, why these ones survive, what they represent. I think there's, this makes me sound like very anti-democratic and an anti, uh, but I, I had real issues with like the idea that you could immediately go in and just start interpreting without knowing the landscape of race, mm -hmm. without knowing the landscape of, of class in Boston at this moment, and think that somehow you were gaining, there's this fetishization, especially with the founding moments, like or colonial moments in the US with like, kind of like a psychic connection with the founders in the States that, and I find this with colonial era documents in the state that like, I didn't want, like, I don't know if you guys in France have an equivalent, you can Google uh, David Barton wall builders. It's this person who believes like in the church and state didn't exist. And he has this collection of historical documents. I'm not sure he actually uses so much as kind of like, is around them and feels them. Um, and so there, this question of, like, I actually wanted to foreground A, the uncertainty and B, the contextualization. So we're actually giving up on kind of pre-built representations and actually going to use some of the money we have to hire a web developer and kind of develop a one-off. What are the historical network analysis? We're doing that, but again, those don't, those aren't great at showing but you could do who's not in them. Um, and like, we, the, we don't know what we don't know in this context. Right. So that's where the network analysis and GIS have been points to start, um, but we're going to try and do kind of one-off with a web developer because I don't think, which goes to the question of like resources and stuff like this. Like this is at Northeastern, at least if you play the right game of like neoliberal Mad Libs um, and throw together like digital experiential health humanities, you can get money. Yeah. Um, but uh, I know that's not, and then you have to think about like, where will this live and who will maintain it? And anyways, so that's a real question. Yeah, uh, quickly. Um, the French unions and mutual, I don't know. Uh, it, it's obviously a very different setting, um, but um, French unions have very few members. They have fewer members, in fact, than American unions today. France is the only country that has a lower union density than the US. But by law, since 1946, they have been in representatives of the working class. Mm -hmm. But so this means what? This means that in big political discussions, they play a role. But in specific companies, uh, you know, if they have hardly any members, they might not be able to push for, uh, you know, separate um, health care insurance, which is what a mutual would be. But I, I I'd have to look into it. Um, the Paul Andre Rosentel, I, I, I remember uh, listening to him talking about silicosis. Uh, um, uh, in fact, a long time ago at the US US, and, um, and I know about his work. And um, in in the US, there are also historians of professional diseases, and, and, and that's that's well known. Um, and I think. The, what I'm suggesting is is that uh, that's one way to get to those uh, issues of professional disease. The other way is to, as I said, to instead to focus on the uh, on local, uh, uh, very local, uh, a town or a neighborhood, to uh, to really understand how class is reflected in uh, uh, in, in bodies. Um, the one thing that I learned reading these uh, articles in social epidemiology is you look at Chicago and the life expectancy, the gap between the richest neighborhood and the, and the forest is 30 years. Oh, yeah. there was a it's, thing in it's Boston crazy. Recently that, it's crazy. That, Chicago is the, has the highest gap. The smallest census tract in Boston, Roxbury was like 55 and there was a census tract in Back Bay that was like almost 90. Almost. Yeah, it's... When is that? This, this was just like a, uh, a few weeks ago, this was reported mm -hmm. upon. And then immediately they said, this is why the data doesn't actually mean what you think it does. And mm -hmm. these census tracts are kind of isolated, but it, it's striking. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of it, of course, is, is race, right? Mm -hmm. But then you look at New York and the Bronx has a very, very, people in the Bronx have a very high life expectancy. Mm 
so you know local local dynamics do uh, do do uh, do play a role. So uh, I think at some point you have to focus on a city yeah. and, and follow it for several years uh, mm -hmm. as long as you have the the records. And I I totally agree with you that we are not statisticians. So we have to be literate enough in statistics to be able to talk with statisticians mm -hmm. and, and, and tell them what we what we need. Uh, and and it's a collaboration yeah. and, and be heard. So yeah. Uh, but it's uh, I think if I could ask, you know, I, I'm hoping just as we're sort of you know moving toward the culmination here, I'll uh, flip this around so people can hear. <laughs> I was thinking just as we're moving toward the culmination of the symposium, one thing that struck me is that this focus on the environment sort of took us out to the macro level, yeah. even as it was interested in, you know, I, I know you're both interested in individual stories and thinking about, you know, frameworks that affect individual people, but this is a far cry from, you know, the clinical encounter between, you know, how to think about the clinical encounter between the doctor and the patient. And so, yeah, I'm wondering if there are ways to kind of think about bridging these conversations, not to say that, you know, the work of social epidemiology that you need to think or have a ready answer about how to translate, you know, the labor politics um, uh, and, and labor history into the clinic, but but I but I'm just struck by the sort of scalar differences between the conversations and I was wondering. Um, yeah, if you if if either of you had thoughts about how to begin to think about these conversations, either you know, in, in some kind of dialogue with one another, or whether they remain, um, or whether they remain kind of separate tracks within a, a, the same field, if that makes sense. I know that social epidemiology is obviously, as as you mentioned, and and thinking about these kinds of you know demographic environmental factors, um, are hugely important to obviously to the life and health of individuals. But I'm wondering, yeah, I don't know if you have thoughts about about that. So. I know it's a hard question. I didn't mean to make you summarize the symposium, but yeah. I, I kind of felt like if, it, if we started out saying we needed to do 1960s social history, we moved into calling for like 1980s micro history by the end of it. That's like that's actually, <laughs> I thought like both of us were like in the end saying that like these large. But even when you say micro, micro history, you're drawing inferences that really navigate between the interpersonality of the clinical encounter and what Galton would call the structural violence of the larger picture. And I think that that's, you know, being able to move between those registers is extremely important because if you float up here, you're done for, right? Mm -hmm. And if you remain in the sense of American individualism, and the interpersonal relationship of the clinical encounter without understanding the structural violence right. that undergirds all of that, you're also toast, right? So I don't know if that helps at all in terms of your question, but I think that's where the, um, mm -hmm. the real not facile, um, the, the not versatility is in the right word, but mobility can help. I think it's, I agree with you. But uh, I think for historians, the question of uh, scale, uh -huh. we call in French l'échelle. Mm -hmm. And depending on the historical in investigation that you're, that you're um, doing, you know, the, how you define your object, you could be very much macro or you could be very much micro and still take into account you know, all these dynamics, you know, but... Um, uh, uh, certainly in, in, in history, you will have people who are very focused on the micro and uh, others who will look at, you know, historical processes from a, a much more global perspective. And I, I think it's a mistake to, to root for one specific type of history as a, a, an approach as opposed to, to others. I think they... They, they are complementary, not necessarily within the same book, yeah. but overall for to build knowledge, uh, uh, you need people who, uh, uh, you know, uh, combine uh, uh, those different uh, 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 approaches. Uh, and don't, I think, and don't stick to a fixed frame just for the... Uh, yeah, 
yeah for the sake of it i guess like yeah that's like, my issue with like the, the the deep or big histories in the environment that mm -hmm. like it all of human history is like a, a paragraph on a page or something like this and the insistent it's a mm -hmm. it's a it's in, like a fetishization of scale rather than mm -hmm. anything more critical mm -hmm. So we're at 8.07. I don't know if anybody has a last comment or question that they would like to raise Thank you. or, yeah, sure. That's... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for, and I don't know, Sophie, if you want to come up also and just say thank you. Uh, thank you too to everyone for joining us and uh over the last few days so yeah okay it's been a delight thank and a pleasure thank you so much for yeah. joining us yeah a bientôt à Paris. Yeah. and thank you to the asl interpreters i know sarah had to go thank you so much. but thank you Iris. yeah thank you yeah, yeah. yeah that was all right great. So, oh my all right so and yeah.